All right, all right, all right. Welcome, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes to another episode of Skep Talk. I'm Erica, your gentle and modern host, and today is March 4th, 3-4, 2024. Assuming you're in the United States, you would organize it in that fashion. And I am super psyched to be here with Aaron again. It's been quite some time since we were last together, but last time I had a blast, and I know we're going to have a good time today as well, because before we came in here, Aaron was telling me a cool story about the time that he saw Aurora Borealis, which I've never seen. I'm a little bit better about that. Before we listen to the rest of the story, because I, I told him I was going to make him <laughs> tell me the remainder of it on air, I would like to remind everybody that if you're out there and you're thinking to yourself, I've got like a question on like evolution, biological anthropology, physics, Aaron's got that down pat, or any kind of uh, topic that you might desire posing to two folks who are academia and academia adjacent that's where i would call myself at present until i get that pesky doctorate call in whether you're a young earth creationist or a flat earther or you believe in ghosts or bigfoot or anything like that call in we would absolutely love to hash it out with you and this is like a golden opportunity if you're one of those people out there who's always looking for an opportunity to like um pose this against folks who who aren't aren't religious you know what i mean so call in make use of us it's going to be great and as a friendly reminder to those of you out there who are regular skeptic viewers you can like super chat in if you don't feel like come calling and having like a full conversation with us and we're gonna have to answer all those super chats at the end anyways if it's five dollars or more we are bound by internet law to answer those super chats to the best of our abilities and I, I don't know. I think that would be really fun if you did it too, because it would support the line, which we we love we love doing around here. So, Aaron, tell me more about this aurora borealis that you saw, because I've never seen it, and my my dad saw it once years ago. But it was like he's a Canadian, so I feel like that's like a part of like if you're born in Canada, you just get to see the aurora borealis. And I've been like Indiana and South for most of my time in the United States, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And while I'm not too much further north than that, like I grew up in Michigan, so that's barely north of Indiana. Um, nonetheless, um, I should note that with my story of seeing the Aurora Borealis, I am not seeing it as well as those of the most northern climbs. So those in Alaska, those especially like Sweden, Norway, they get the really beautiful shows on a fairly regular Ribbon. basis. This was some yeah. sporadic uh, event that happened mid 2000s, more or less. I was in college at the time and I was leaving one of the buildings on campus to go back to my dormitory. And I'm looking up and I'm thinking, huh, clouds look weird tonight. They look kind of green. I wonder if it's some like weird light effect from the city or something. I was wondering, like, what kind of pollution is there around campus <laughs> this time? I don't know. <laughs> um, and I don't think too much more about it. I go to bed. I wake up the next day and find it on the news. Oh, there was basically this like mass ejection from the sun that basically um, is it's it's usually um, particles coming from the sun interacting with Earth's magnetic field to produce the aurora yeah. borealis in the first place. But there was a very large reaction and at just the right angle, so that there were sightings of the northern lights all the way down to Texas that night. So I look up and I see this green stuff, and I just think it's weird clouds. Not realizing, yeah. oh, this is one of the things I've always wanted to see in person, but my dumb, dumb brain couldn't put two to two together that time. <laughs> Listen, if it was me, I would have been like, oh my God, it's like cartoonish Godzilla radiation, right? It would not have occurred to me. I wouldn't have even gone so far as to rationalize that it was from the city. I would have just been like, oh, okay, like, you know, whatever. It's it's something that I cannot comprehend. And I would have moved on. I, I I'm regularly like imperceptive to that kind of thing, though. Like we had an earth, we had an earthquake, um, where, where I'm at a couple of weeks ago, and I it was a, it was a, the exact same thing, right? Like I pull out my phone and I'm like, it's trending on Twitter in my local area, and it's like, oh my god, like, did you feel that earthquake? That was crazy. And I'm like, no, I most certainly did not feel it. I was either asleep or daydreaming, and I I just it did not even um like light up in my brain that the the crust beneath my 
feet was quaking. So, you know, I probably wouldn't have noticed Aurora Borealis either. <laughs> what if you had both of them with the double rainbow? With the double rainbow, then that might pique my interest and like a volcano in the background and, you know, a good, like a, a sped up a glacial advance and retreat, perhaps, perhaps. But at the same time, again, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Well, how have you been otherwise? Uh, not bad. I actually just got back from Florida seeing my parents down there. So uh, um, good weather, good times, maybe a little too much to drink, but all good. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where I'm at, the weather has been so amazing recently. And I have to like, it, it's like a, a double-edged sword, right? Cause on one hand I'm like, wow, it's 70, 80 degrees. And it's, this was like last week and it's February. Like, this is amazing. And then it's like, no, it's not. This, this is the end of the world. <laughs> this is catastrophic climate change in action. The daffodils are poking through the ground and it's February 27th what is going on right like we've got the full-on blossoms on the trees little leaflets starting to pop up it is extremely alarming but you know it, if it's going to be the end of the world i guess it's nice that uh, that there's a a breeze that keeps me cool on my afternoon and evening walks yes just a crisp day to the apocalypse yeah of course of course well okay i'm taking a look here i'm seeing okay we've got some killer calls already on the lines. Are you cool if we just go ahead and get started? If we just go ahead Let's and get, get started. started. Let's do yeah, it. All away. right. We're going in order. First one, you already know this, Aaron. We already discussed it a little bit before we actually like came in here today. This is a question on human chromosome two fusion uh, by QC, pronounce he him from Illinois. He's an atheist and uh, he wants to know if there are any problems with having a human population growing from individuals with the chromosome two fusion. So let's let QC on. QC, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Wonderful, fantastic, and you sound great. Oh my god, anytime there's no audio issues when I'm here, it's, it's just, it's, it's miraculous. Fill us in a little bit on your question. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I think we all know chromosome 2 fusion is one of kind of the um, best examples of um, proof that humans evolved. So um, one of the things that I hear from different theists uh, when this comes up is that, um, you know, obviously personal incredulity, how could, uh, how could this happen? Uh, because their assumption is that you would have to have an individual, a male with a chromosome 2 fusion, um, mating with a female with chromosome 2 fusion, and then that population has to, you know, somehow, um, you know, survive better than everyone else. So. My, I thought, and I, and this is where I want to get your feedback in terms of what research is there, is that um, it's probably the case that, you know, it's possible for there to be hybrids, you know, an individual with a chromosome 2 fusion being able to mate with uh, an individual that's, uh, that doesn't have the fusion, and, and that's how it, it would spread. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, your your question totally checks out. So for those of you out there who who might not be like uh, hip to the young earth creationist argument jive, right? The the um the hominoids of all of the the apes generally, and then the specific subset of that being the hominids, have a variety of different chromosome numbers um, at the hominoid level. And when you move down to the the great apes specifically, you have humans who, who have forty six, and the, the rest of the great apes which have forty eight. And so when this was first uncovered way back in like, I think it was like the 60s and the 70s, the big question was, okay, what's going on here, right? If, if humans are, are in fact great apes and we share a common ancestor with the rest of the great apes, what happened to our genome so that we have one fewer pair of chromosomes as compared to the others, right? And the, there were two hypotheses here that were put forward, one being clearly more reasonable than the other. The first is that there was a fusion event in, in the human line, and the, the other was that there was a fission event in tannins, gorillans, and pongens, which would be a mighty big coincidence for that to occur effectively in the same way across all of these groups. So we were like, okay, well, it, it's probably a fusion site. Now, the cool thing about this is that if there was a chromosomal fusion in the hominin line, it had to have happened after the split between hominins and panins, and it would have two blatant telltale signs. Actually, it's more like three blatant telltale signs. 
right? At the ends of each chromosomes, which are those little uh, genetic packages that contain your, your DNA, they, they shape, they're shaped kind of like X's. And at the tips of those, you have uh, telomeres, right? The, the caps of the chromosomes. And um, there, there are these little repeats that kind of signify that that's the region of the genome that you're in. I believe it's TTAGGG. No, yeah, TTAGGG is it in forward, and then you, you have the reverse on the other end. So if there was a chromosomal fusion, then you would expect to find, right, if, if the chromosomes fuse end to end, telomeres in the center or the telomeric signal in the center of whatever chromosome is the resolution. And not only that, but you would expect that, that new fused chromosome to have two centromeres because every chromosome has uh, a little centromeric structure in the center of the X. And if there had been, if there had been a fusion event, right, then you would have two centromeres, the legitimate one, and then a, a cryptic one that used to be the second chromosome's centromere. So Lo and behold, when the human genome was sequenced, we find not only the diffusion site in the form of telomeric repeats right dead in the center of human chromosome 2, making it a fusion of chimpanzee chromosomes 12 and 13, which were renamed chimpanzee chromosome 2A and 2B, but we also found the cryptic centromere, and the third and perhaps most important sign that I think gets overlooked all the time when talking about the fusion is that there is radical syntony over the rest of, of, the, um, of that chromosome with chimp 2A and 2B. So the entirety of human chromosome 2, like the top half looks like, I believe it's 2B for chimps, and then the, the bottom half looks completely like chimp 2A. That is an absolute insane design choice to make if human chromosome 2 is not the result of a fusion, right? So then the question that, that creationists take at that point, right, the, the, the argument that they make, as QC is, has asked here, is they're like, okay, well, let's say that that does happen in an in, in individual. How does it spread to the rest of the population? Um, they, and they're, they're like, because you have to have a, a male that has it and a female that has it, and then they, they reproduce with one another and, and all that good stuff. As you already said, you see, it doesn't, it's not all or nothing, right? Like, it's not going to be a situation where uh, an individual who has the, the fusion cannot reproduce with individuals that don't have the fusion. And this is a case for like a great many aspects of genetics, right? Like you, you can have a gene that your partner doesn't have and you guys can reproduce and the kids might have the gene and they might not. So there's not, it's not like there's a sterility produced here between those that have it and those that don't. Case in point, there are humans today that can be born with Robertsonian translocations and have a different number of chromosomes than is typical. They can reproduce and form vi and uh, create viable offspring with those who, um, who don't have the Robertsonian translocation. And don't quote me on this, I can't remember, but I believe the offspring may or may not have it as well. So it, it's entirely dependent um, on how that sorting actually works. But I think an important additional thing to consider here is that creationists accept implicitly that this has happened before in other lineages that they accept as related, right? Creationists will accept that zebras and horses are the same kind of animal, and there have been telomere to telomere fusions in that lineage. So they already agree that this is something that can and does happen, and that if it happens in a single individual as it would have had to have happened in them as it has in, in our lineage, it would have been allowed to proliferate into the rest of the population. This whole game changes to the second there's any selective benefit. Now, I don't think we know if the fusion was selectively beneficial or not, I, I don't think that research has been done. I think as of right now, we're under the impression that it, that it was kind of like a neutral thing and that it, it might have just been drift that moved it to fixation. Um, but e if it had like the slightest benefit, this all of a sudden this becomes even easier than it already was. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that was kind of my question, whether there is research that confirms that there is a benefit that would help proliferate this change, or is it just kind of a guess for now? Well, it's, it's not whether or not it's a guess or it was beneficial, right? It can still move to fixation in a population, even if it's completely neutral. We see this with characteristics today all the time, right? Things like hair color. It's not necessarily beneficial to have brown hair color over black. We have both alleles present, but it is possible that in some populations, everybody there is going to have brown hair, even though there was no selective benefit to it. You see what I mean? So even without yeah, the but beneficial... With the it can move to fixation. Yeah, I, I guess the thought is that the chromosome to fusion should be very rare, right? It, it shouldn't be hap it shouldn't be like a, a regular allele. You know, this is a f should be a fairly rare uh, occurrence. 
yeah, fair, fairly rare, I think, would be an okay way to put it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it only happened once. It could be that there have been multiple fusions across the, the history of the hominins, and it's just that one of them did finally move to fixation. And then is there um, research that says that, uh, in, I mean, you gave an example, but, you know, for this type of fusion that a hybrid would be viable and it could actually reproduce? Yes. Yes. And it's not just in, in horses and um, like within equids. You also see it with modern suids, like modern day pigs um, and babarusas, which are like a really closely related, um, I think they're, I think they're suoids. They might be suids themselves um, actually as well. So we see this in other organisms that cre any creationist who you will ask will say are definitely related. Like there's not a creationist on the planet I that I've ever encountered who would say horses and zebras aren't a part of the same kind. And yet they require a telomere to telomere fusion for them to, to have proliferated from a common ancestor. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you've, you know, confirmed what I was kind of expecting. I just wanted to kind of hear it from someone who has a little more uh, knowledge and uh, background on this. So um, thank you very much for your answer. Wonderful. Aaron, do you have anything you want to add to this? I'm kind of like, I was like feeling hot. I was on, I came in hot <laughs> on that one. Well, the thing is you're knowledgeable about this. So I'm going to have a bit of follow-up question because this is now a curiosity. Do we know of any populations, humans, other animals, plants that we can see that um, a subset of the species has a fusion event and uh, another fraction doesn't, so we can actually see the basically a mixture of fusion, no fusion in a population, a living population. You know what? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I would assume that somewhere out there that that probably exists, but I would not wager that it's within mammals, um, because as QC pointed out, it's not a particularly common. Um, it's not a particularly common mutation to have, uh, particularly given some fusion events are going to be more um, detrimental than others. Like some fusion events will carry no adverse effects and some will. Uh, some of them can even be lethal, like out, out the gate, like in utero and, and cease development. I think you could potentially point to the fact that Robertsonian translocations exist in modern humans as an example. Uh, like that we see this, this, um, I believe it's a fusion. I, I mean, like, yeah, it's a fusion. I can't remember which chromosomes are fusing in it, uh, but where humans have a, like different number of chromosomes than the, the traditional 46 and they get on just fine. And if memory serves, again, I'm, I'm not positive on this, but their offspring, I believe can have either condition. So technically that would be an example of, of what you're talking about, right? Is that there's a small subset of humans that do have a different number of chromosomes than is typical. Well, at least within plants, polyploidy is pretty common, right? So I would imagine oh, there yeah. might be some plant species that have that. Oh, sure. Or, or I believe you could look at um, some really basic like eukaryotes as well, like maybe like single single cellular eukaryotes. But I think like if you if you want to look at like these sort of intermediate stages, genetically speaking, um, but creationists will never, they don't like plants. The second plants come onto the equation, they just kind of like turn off because it's not like the cool, sexy, big animals that are like, you know, they look cool and they're awesome and, and everybody likes them. And then it's like you, the second plants are in the conversation, they kind of just turn off. But that's also because plants are problematic to them in many, like, why does an onion have so much larger of a genome than a human if the size of the genome is related to information and God bestows information like metaphysically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I also love plants with creationists just because uh, the explanation of the different fossil layers because the different animals that could more successfully run away from the floodwaters, that doesn't explain plants unless some trees are very capable of running. Yeah, no, it does. It, well, it doesn't explain plants and they like to point to another one of my favorites is they point to the, you know, I'm sure you've heard of like the polystrate fossils where you'll have like, mm. you'll be like, look at this tree, it's fossilized and it goes through millions of layers of rock. No, it most certainly does not go through millions of layers of rock, right? It goes through millions, or not millions of layers, um, uh, strata representing millions of years. No, it is not going through strata representing millions of years. It is going through several different strata because it's in like a floodplain or something. We see this happening now where a, a tree will get sequentially buried every spring and every fall as the floods roll in and cover it more and more. 
Um, this is not, it's not being properly portrayed by them. And to make matters worse, if it were a global flood, why do so many of these polystrate fossils have regenerative growth that show that when the tree is, is like uh, maybe been buried a couple layers deep and it's maybe just barely poking out at the top, Portions of the tree and of the root system will curve up and grow towards the surface of the mud that they've been buried in, poke through and try to salvage the tree's life. If the tree is under, you know, the effect, effectively the entire geologic column as the flood laid it down on top, right? How is regenerative growth happening, right? This, this doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, they don't like plants very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, QC. I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that was helpful. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Wonderful. Take care. All right. Wait, drop call. Okay, sweet. Cool. I love the human chromosome two fusion. Again, I'm sorry I kind of like went at that one, but I I, I, I I let the people who know what they're talking about talk about the things they know what they're talking about. <laughs> See, Aaron, I feel like this is perfect then because our next all is from a theist and they specifically want to ask you about the big bang and um and cosmology in general how do you feel about that are you psyched well so long as i can answer this only with lyrics from bare naked lady songs okay <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh what is it it's been three weeks since you looked at me so three weeks since you've discussed this right uh it it's been it's been a hot minute. <laughs> it's been okay. Well, let's 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 uh, revitalize it. Anthony, pronouns he him from Virginia. He's a theist. Anthony, I see here you're skeptical of Big Bang cosmology, and you want to have a discussion about that. You're with a pro here tonight, so please elaborate a little bit on your question, and then we're going to let Aaron take it away. Welcome. Yeah. So yesterday I called into uh, the line, and Jimmy and Matt were there. And we got into a discussion about uh, Big Bang cosmology, and I, I, they asked, were asking about it, and I Excuse expressed me. my belief Excuse that. Me. Excuse yes, me. A Anthony, you need to move your mouth farther away from the microphone. Okay, right. is this better? A little bit, a little it's bit better. A little bit. Yeah, the, right. I've consistent. Yeah, uh, if it if it if it's too bad. Um, let me know. Try to adjust a little bit. Uh, anyways, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So they were asking, and I, and I expressed my belief that I don't really believe uh, the Big Bang. Uh, and there are two particular points of question. One is the singularity from which everything supposedly exploded. And then there was the concept of the expansion of the universe. So I guess my question for you is this. Uh, well, let, or let me, let, a little bit more. I don't believe scientists can possibly know anything uh, with any level of certainty about the singularity. And I'm quite skeptical about their ability to know anything about a supposed expansion of the universe. So my question would be, why do what do scientists actually know about the singularity? How do they know it? And the same question for the expansion of the universe. All right, well, I'm going to actually answer that's it backwards. A great place to start. No, Aaron, yeah. take it away. I'm, I'm I was just going to say this is yeah. made for you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to say I'm going to answer it backwards because let's first talk about the expansion because that is the most direct thing that we can observe. We can actually observe the expansion of the universe by multiple methods. So one is that the um, observations that were first done back in the 1920s by Edwin Hubble, when he was measuring the distance to various galaxies and finding out, hey, the further away these galaxies are, the faster they seem to be moving away from us. And this was true, pointing the, his telescope in all different directions. And this has been confirmed by observations for the last century, that there is this nice linear relationship between how far away a galaxy is and how fast it's receding away from us, which is exactly what you expect if you have an expanding universe. Um, the way you can tell this is one, um, figuring out the distance to those galaxies. There's a few different methods. The thing he was using was uh, using a kind of star called a Cepheid variable. These are stars that actually oscillate um, in their brightness in very regular ways, and their um, rates of oscillation tell you what their underlying brightness is. If you know how bright it is, then you can figure out how um, far it is away based on 
the brightness that you're measuring. So that was a method, and there's been other similar methods that can tell us how far away a given galaxy or object is, and we can figure out the speed they're moving away from us by redshift. So the same sort of way with sound, where if there's a uh, train coming towards you, it sounds higher pitch when it's moving away lower pitch. Light does a similar thing. If it's moving away, it's redshifted, and the amount it's shifted is depending on how fast it is moving away from us. So we can observe the light from galaxies, and we've done this with a huge survey, and see, yeah, the further away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us in this nice linear relationship, which is a absolute expectation from the general theory of relativity from that Einstein guy you've probably heard of. So when it comes to the expansion, we can directly see it. Uh, okay, so there, I think there's a lot of problems with that. Um, so I know that uh, scientists originally proposed the idea the universe is expanding, as you mentioned, in the uh, early 1900s, correct? I believe one of the leading um, proponents of this... I'm, I'm sure it was probably proposed before that, but they it, it gained credibility in the scientific community in like the, the early to mid-1900s, right? Uh, so to pull, put out the full timeline, so about 1915, 1916, Einstein publishes his general theory of relativity. 1920s, Edwin Hubble has his observations of, of um, expansion as looking at, at various galaxies. Um, by the 30s or 40s, the idea of Big Bang cosmology first comes about with uh, people like Lemaitre, who was actually a Belgian Catholic priest as well as a cosmologist. Um, and he didn't call it the Big Bang. He called it, I think he called it either the, the primordial atom or the primordial egg. I forget exactly which term he used. Big Bang was a derogatory term added by a different atheist uh, um, astronomer by the name of uh, Fred Hoyle. Strangely enough, it was an atheist who had a problem with the Big Bang. Um, but uh, times have changed. Uh, then by the, um, if I remember correctly, it's the 1960s, we then make the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. And this is basically the afterglow from the um, Big Bang. So basically, as the universe is expanding, then the various gases and dust in there are spreading out and cooling, because in the same way, when a gas expands, it loses uh, uh, its temperature goes down. And if that's the case, then there should be some sort of uh, way of measuring that gas cooling down over time and that, that light stretching out as it's crossing the universe. And lo and behold, accidentally, with this uh, radio telescope in the 1960s, they point their telescope in all directions, and there's just this constant hum from the microwave background. They tried cleaning out, thinking it could even be bird poop or anything else, and eventually publish, and somebody else realizes, hey, this is the exact observation that we've been expecting from that Big Bang cosmology idea. Um, and we have now supremely measured that back background. When I say supremely measured, we are looking at variations in the temperature of uh, the cosmic microwave background down to the parts of one in a hundred thousand. And we can look at those small fluctuations and they follow statistical rules that actually tell us the rate of expansion, uh, the uh, elements that, uh, when I say elements, I should actually back that up, uh, the kinds of matter that existed back then. So um, basically the distribution of all these little variations are what you'd expect from there being dark matter and dark energy along with a little bit of the regular matter that we're made out of. Um, it also has these oscillations that look like they're most consistent with something that's called cosmic inflation, but this is an add-on to the original Big Bang Theory that's probably just going to overcomplicate things. Nonetheless, one of the major key observations was the cosmic microwave background, and it is an absolutely stellar um, high precision thing that we have been measuring for decades and decades and is has no other good explanation besides uh, the Big Bang model. So are you saying, again, I'm, I'm having problems with a lot of what's being said, uh, but just this microwave, this uh, background radiation, um, is this something that exists only in a Big Bang cosmology, or is it something that could theoretically exist in a steady state universe? And what about the, it seems to me like there's background radiation, okay, why does that prove the universe exploded from a singularity? Well, one, no, it's the wrong, Aaron, but isn't 
isn't it the case that this isn't it the case that the CMB was a, like a direct prediction that was set out, put in ink prior to its actual discovery and investigation? Yes, so I, it my, was. My, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so there was already the prediction that if there was this big bang event, that there was some time in the finite past where the universe expanded from an extremely small point, then we should see the effects of all that superheated compressed gas basically leaving the afterglow across the entire universe, and it should give a symmetric distribution of temperature across mm -hmm. the entire night sky. And the people who discovered it discovered it by accident, and there was another uh, uh, astrophysicists looking at that and said, holy shnikes, they found the thing we've been looking for. <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Well, um, can you explain it, this in a... Now, th your question about can you explain this with a steady state model? There were attempts to do that once this was discovered. So first off, it's a hallmark of a questionable theory if it doesn't make a prediction, but then somebody can go back and say, oh mm -hmm. yeah, totally fits the data anyways. Um, and the attempts to do that have been very contrived, and they have additional things that they don't observe. For example, the steady state models that would have a cosmic microwave background would also expect that if you look back far enough, you will not see things redshifted from us, but actually begin to blue shift because they'll be oscillating in both directions. Most of the universe will be oscillating away from us, but then you look further back away, then there's some of those oscillations that should be coming back towards us and being blue shifted. We've never observed something like that on any cosmic scale. So if anything, observations are against that. And it was kind of a kludge to throw in there in the first place. Um, so as I understand, I don't know of any uh, working cosmologists that hold to this sort of stuff anymore. And the very few that did were a couple old students of Fred Hoyle who hated the Big Bang Theory because he thought it would look too much like creationism. And when I've looked at their uh, papers, uh, they basically just cry out, we're the new Galileo, we're the new Galileo, we're being so persecuted, when in fact, everyone's just laughing at their rhetoric. Um, about the, 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 the cosmic uh, microwave radiation, um, mm -hmm. from what I understand, it, it does vary from point to point in the sky, but when you take a complete general look at things, it seems to be uniformly distributed. Is that correct? It's, it's very uniform. The oscillations in it are fractions of a degree in temperature. So they are very, very small um, oscillations. Sometimes like you have to be measuring them down to like um, to one part in 100,000 to actually have noticeable difference from one part of the sky versus another. Okay. See, uh, when I think about an explosion, it would lead to significant variations from location to location within the universe of this variation, but in a steady state, it would have time to balance out. So, I, I the the exist. First of all, they, they claim the existence of the background radiation is proof itself. I I think there's a lot of things out there that we could be, you know, creating or causing this, and it isn't necessarily explained by a singularity expansion, but uh, well, like, I like haven't what? Seen any proof. what would be what would be an well, alternative be, means to explain the CMB? There's a lot of uh, things in the universe that emit various types of radiation. I think we're just beginning to understand a lot about the different celestial bodies that are out well, there. Well, you're the talking about individual objects that might, but here's the thing: individual objects very far away are going to be point-like. We're talking about something filling up every single it's square steradian everywhere. of the nighttime sky in all directions evenly. That is not what you get from a whole bunch of point-like sources. But over time, you would expect it to fill the entire universe, even if it's Anthony, originating from various points. You would, but you would also expect concentrations near those sources, which is not what we see at all. In fact, it is like, it, you know, forgive me if I mess this up, Aaron, but like it is, it's pretty, <laughs> as bad as uniform as uniform gets. Yeah, like I say, it's yeah, extremely I, uh, tiny fluctuations. In fact, um, the level of smoothness was actually even considered a problem with earlier models of the Big Bang, which is one of the things that cosmic inflation helped solve because it actually further flattened out any sorts of um, uh, oscillations um, or um, variations. Now, like I say, 
uh, inflation is itself and um, I don't saying an add on sounds like it's just kind of a kludge, but this was an additional thing that was proposed by Alan Guth back in 1980 um, at, at MIT. And since I have an affiliation at MIT, woohoo. Um, <laughs> but Guth's idea is basically um, a, an extremely early exponential expansion of the universe in like the very earliest moments there that actually helped solve a couple different uh, problems with that cosmological picture. And I will say that inflation doesn't have the same level of universal regard as the Big Bang itself. But as most cosmologists, and they'd probably say inflation is more likely right than wrong, though we're still trying to get more definitive evidence one way or the other about that. Um, so I'm just trying to stick with so only the theory that universally uh, accepted by cosmologists. Right, the one that's tied to the CMB, which as the three of us have discussed already, has no other existing alternative explanation for its ubiquitous presence. Right, like the, it, is, it is the singular okay. hypothesis, the single theory that stands above all others at this moment in time, and it's not even close. It's also worth, in fact, I should note another feature about this is that it's not just radiation. It's also radiation 100% consistent with black body radiation. It is consistent mm -hmm. with something that was hot and that has cooled down to 2.7 Kelvin, which is what we call damn cold. <laughs> uh, that's 2.7 Kelvin. That's 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. So it is basically about the coldest you will ever experience, even with modern tech. You have to go to CERN to even have any large scale thing below two Kelvin. And even there, it's hard to maintain. Um, so the fact that you get black body radiation across the entire universe in all directions with only tiny variations that seem to also correspond to like the tiny bits of clustering of matter that would lead ultimately to things like stars and galaxies is supremely expected from a Big Bang model. And it's only with a bunch of kludges and other uh, observational issues can you get that to fit with a steady state model. Um, I should also note a few other things. First off, if we look further back in time, by looking further back in the sky, because the further uh, away you look at things, it's further back in time because of the finite speed of light. We look back there and we can look at the chemical composition of things and we see, hey, it's mostly hydrogen and helium. There's almost none of the other heavier elements, um, which indicates that, hey, the fusion process had to build that up more and more over time. That's not something you would expect if this were this just continuous steady state for the universe. Um, you would expect a little bit more steadiness across that. Um, also worth noting that the creation of uh, hydrogen, helium, and tiny trace amounts of lithium are the sorts of things that you would also predict from particle physics if you started with an extremely hot, dense state that the early universe would have been in, that basically in those first couple of minutes that you would have developed and had those um, uh, lighter elements. And it's kind of a crazy thing. Lithium, number three on the periodic table, virtually all the lithium in the universe was created at the Big Bang. It's actually not something that gets normally created in atomic fusion in stars. So strangely enough, the lithium in my computer right now for the battery, um, almost all of it came from the Big Bang. Um, and otherwise, we don't have an explanation uh, for like nuclear processes that would produce it. Uh, I don't, okay, so again, uh... There's so much to comment on. I, to me, and this, this might be my ignorance, because I'm not an expert in this field, but I feel like the uniformity of the background radiation is, is more consistent with a steady state model than a Big Bang model. And again, that's, that's maybe, I'm yielding that that may be my ignorance. Um, and I don't so see... Okay, go ahead. The, 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 the most straightforward way to, to show that that notion is incorrect, and I, I understand where you're coming from, like, intuitively speaking, like, but science rarely follows our intuition or common sense. And from our point being so tiny in the, in the grand scheme of how, how large the universe actually is, um, the, this, this problem of common sense leading us astray is, is even more exacerbated. But the model, again, of steady state versus the, the Big Bang, as we understand it, right? Both of these models had specific predictions before we were able to investigate things like the CMB, right? Before we, we even knew about it or, or had uh, instruments that were capable of, of picking it up and knowing what we were looking at, right? And yet the CMB has been discovered, analyzed, right? And it matches only the Big Bang to the exclusion of steady state, which has, as Aaron outlined, tried to accommodate it and failed. 
on multiple different fronts that, you know, we can go back and listen to, to what Aaron said uh, later to hear each of these failed predictions and, and failed accommodations. So at this point, I don't think that you can say like, well, I still feel like steady state better accommodates it because it, it doesn't by the admission of the, the people who came up because it wasn't included in their original predictions that, that the CMB would even be a thing. I should also add that I think one thing that might be leading Anthony astray is that he refers to the Big Bang as an explosion. And I think that is driving your intuition in uh, erroneous ways, because more correctly, we should be referring to the Big Bang as an expansion from an earlier state, and not even necessarily a singularity, if there is even singularities at all, is... Um, uh, Arguably not the case. Most people don't think singularities even exist. But nonetheless, if you instead think of it as an expansion, then you're thinking of the expansion of a gas. Well, an expanding gas is going to expand pretty much evenly. In fact, the only reason you get any sort of clumpiness at all um, in some sort of expanding gas is because of another force being involved. And it's the force that, uh, well, keeps my feet on the ground, gravity. The reason we have any clumpiness at all is ultimately the additional force of gravity that in some cases can overcome the repulsion from gas being too hot to be pushed apart. Um, and that's kind of the fundamental thing that pretty much all of uh, astrophysics will get uh, down to just dealing with two things, hot stuff and heavy stuff. The hotness mm. basically causing an outward expansion and the heaviness from gravity that tries to pull things and clump things together. Um, if you don't have gravity and you just have an expanding gas, you're going to have pretty much a perfectly even mixture everywhere. The only reason we got any clumpiness is our friend um, uh, Big G, as I like to call him. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Let's let's go with that. I, I find that an interesting uh, uh, notion about an expansion. And uh, I was having a conversation with someone uh, years back about the, the the quote Big Bang. They made an interesting comment, and they stated, that, well, the universe is expanding. And then a question immediately arises, expanding into what? What does it mean, actually, that the universe is expanding? Because supposedly all of space-time was condensed within this alleged uh, singularity. So what exactly is outside the singularity and outside of space-time into which the universe is expanding? Have scientists Try to answer that question. I'm sure you have, but what are, so are there before, before, of, with, before we move directly onto this next point, I, I want to like I want to put a cap on it, right? Like on the the CMB thing, I, I feel that you have your your work cut out for you here, Anthony. Like if you don't want to um, like accept CMB as a successful prediction of of uh, the Big Bang, or maybe you do and you just want to look more into it, I think that that's like as far as that portion of our conversation is, is where you should go next and go and see, okay, like what did steady state predict? What did the big bang predict? And then how does each yeah, line okay, up well, with our obligations we, with regard to CMB? Are, well, are we good on that? Well, we're not because from what I understand, okay. the, uh, the, yeah, um, the, the, the cosmic, well, uh, Aaron mentions, was the idea that the farther we look back into the universe with these uh, space telescopes, the, the the less developed the galaxy should be. And this is something I brought up with Jimmy yesterday, which is that recently, and I, when I say recently, I mean within the last year or two, the James Webb Telescope was able to peer farther into the universe than, than ever before. And if I remember correctly, the scientific community was amazed to find that the farther we looked, the the universe seemed to be at a much greater state of development than had been predicted, according to you know statements made by Big Bang proponent theorists. So it seems to me that the evidence is is kind of trending so, against the Big Bang cosmology. So, so I'm going to have to hop on that exactly. and just squash that hard. I'm going to squash yeah. that hard because every headline that has said that has been just sensational nonsense because not a single scientist who has been publishing these results say anything about this breaking the Big Bang, what it is basically saying is our models for the development of galactic formation need revision. And the question is, what thing is it that our models are not accounting for well? 
is it that we are using an incorrect model for dark matter, for example? That is still something that is very mysterious and theoretical, uh, trying to explain it ter in terms of different forms of gravity. So like there's modified Newtonian dynamics or MOND is a candidate that is used. If it is um, a particle, which uh, many particle theorists try to explain dark matter with, then what kind of particle and what other properties might it have? How much does it cluster? What sort of geometry does it spread around? Those are the sorts of questions that come up. Or the questions might be when we're doing our various computer simulations, are there issues with the way that we're running those simulations? Um, are we dealing with um, heating and cooling methods of the gases correctly? This is something I even remember from some of my undergrad research. Hey, we're seeing... Um, these things with the galaxies and our computer model isn't matching with this. If we add this additional variable, does it help things match better? In other words, it might be that a bunch of the other steps in our very complicated things may not be working out so well in those particular cases. But it's still worth noting that even those galaxies that we are seeing, that we're seeing basically them clustering up and getting bigger faster than might have been initially expected, but they still have basically the primordial abundances of the elements. We don't look back 13 billion years into the past and find um, stars that are like big chunks of uranium or anything like that. No, they are, um, oh, in the parlance of astronomers, low metallicity objects. And for astronomers, anything higher up in the periodic table than helium is called a metal because astronomers don't want to be precise, just to piss off the chemist. Um, you aren't seeing the sorts of things that would say, hey, there's an extra 100 billion years of history here. It's basically saying, hey, our rate of galaxy formation uh, models aren't right. This is not an argument against the Big Bang. This is an argument that we need to do better simulations. And uh, I would so, like some more grant money to run some simulations, please. So I, I want to actually add on to that because I remember explicitly, um, you know, I, I argue a lot with creationists, young earth creationists in particular. It was Jason Lyle that was publicizing and, and um, popularizing a lot of this, like, oh, scientists are saying that the Big Bang is in trouble, whatever. Look, I'm not an astronomer and I'm not a physicist, but I can, you know, stumble my way through these types of papers. None of these papers mentioned the debunking of the Big Bang. It was exclusively pop science coverage. And usually it was pop science coverage that was talking about, as uh, Aaron uh, mentioned here, early, gal early galactic formation, like early formation of galaxies. Then most recently, um, additional work has come out on these, these observations about these, oh, these galaxies, they're so young. Some of them are younger than we expected. They are absolutely positively not the same age as the galaxies that we are surrounded by now, which is effectively what is required under like a, like a steady state or a young earth creationist perspective, which would say that all of the galaxies were created uh, roughly at the same time. Um, this, is, this is completely contra, and this is why like, I've not seen Jason Lyle, at least, the young earth creationist, elaborate on these new findings. He's just been sticking with the whole, oh, when they first found out, they were shocked. No, it was surprising for sure that the galaxies were, were um, older than expected, given the, the time period that we were looking at. But they were not the same age as adjacent galaxies today. They are significantly younger, which serves to reason that they need to be, that the uh, galactic model needs to be revised, but not entirely thrown out. It's a clock that's off by a few ticks. In fact, I'll throw in one other thing that these models have not generally included because it's been a relatively recent theory, but another uh, method for the formation of black holes and producing supermassive black holes that in the very early universe, the only kinds of stars that you can form are the most massive kinds of stars possible. Again, because the, uh, gla the gases are warm, you need even more mass to actually have enough gravitational force to defeat that. Um, this is something called the genes mass or the genes density, if you want to look in the astronomy terms for that. But you basically realize, hey, these stars are so big that at their cores, they could actually maybe start forming black holes or even have black holes at their core, um, keeping them, quote unquote, alive rather than atomic fusion. And then you have gigantic amounts of mass producing these supermassive black holes. And we find, hey, super black, uh, supermassive black holes are at the cores of the vast majority of galaxies. Maybe this is something we need to better understand the seeding of galaxies in the first place, which just means, hey, we just discovered some new observations that might lead us to a completely different formation of black holes, which would be absolutely awesome, but it doesn't throw out everything else that leads us to Big Bang cosmology. Okay. Well, um, I also had a question. When we talk about the redshift and objects in all directions appearing to move farther away from us, the farther they are out. 
and these ideas of uh, the, the farther we look out from Earth into the universe, you know, the younger we should see it. Um, doesn't this kind of presuppose that the Earth is in the exact center of the universe? Like, how do we know we're not see. in the younger portion of I, the universe? And um, I see what you're thinking there, but uh, the thing is, whether we were observing here in the Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, or any other one, everyone will be seeing the same sort of effect that the objects further away from them are going to be moving faster away from them because if you can imagine some sort of membrane that's being stretched, everyone's going to have the same sort of observations. Everything close to them is barely being pulled away and the things far away are being pulled away really far apart. So we would get the same sorts of observations whether we're here on Earth, Alpha Centauri, um, Andromeda Galaxy, um, or any other um, galaxy you care to name. Okay. So as far as the uh, expansion, we would see the same thing no matter where we go. But when it comes to the age of these various, uh, you know, universal bodies and, and galaxies and things, we could potentially be on the outside of things in the younger part. We don't know where we are in relation to everything else. So, so Anthony, I've, I've really... heard this from Jason. I've heard this from Jason Lyle before, right? Like this is this is like a pseudo well it's kind of adjacent to like the white hole cosmology where like god creates everything um in in sort of the middle and and then like creates the earth and things in the middle and then everything else is kind of expanding outward from that um but, but the problem with that is we've received we're receiving light from stars right now that are over six thousand light years away right we, we just we are we that cannot be the case if the earth is six thousand years old um, this is not possible unless God is inherently deceptive and is creating light in transit, which is, interestingly enough, something most creationists would reject because it is, in fact, yeah. deceptive. Um, so yeah, there, there is no way to look at stellar bodies and interpret them as being um, within a, a young Earth time frame. I don't know if that's where you're coming from, but I just I wanted to put No, it's there. not. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I, I don't. Right. Yeah, the universe is older than six. It's in a steady state model. The universe is actually infinitely old, and it kind of recombines and uh, re reprocesses itself infinitely, and everything's in a cycle. But it, 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 so that's kind of the idea is that the uni the physical universe is actually infinitely old, um, and there's logical reasons for believing that would be the case. And uh, the variations we see within the universe are the result of, you know, the motions of the celestial bodies interacting with each other over time, breaking down, you know. And it gets interesting in, in to realize that we're, you know, where God's intervention comes in all this. But um, my point was that it, when you were talking about looking into the universe and assuming that the farther out we look, the younger the, thing, the things are going to be, that presupposes the idea that we're in the exact center of the universe. Because if we're not in the center of the universe, and we're look, we turn in a certain direction, we would expect um, things to be older than we are, and we look in the opposite no, no, direction. No, no, no. That, this, the, this, the observations of the further away you look, the, old, the, um, young, the further back in time you're looking, is going to be true anywhere in the universe. That is going to be okay. independent of your location. Because um, Andromeda Galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. So when we're looking at it, we're looking at it two and a half million years ago. If there are aliens in Andromeda looking back in our direction, they're seeing the Milky Way as it was for them two and a half million years ago. So if we're looking at Andromeda now, we're seeing it after two and a half million years ago. Andromedans looking back at us, they're not even going to see Homo sapiens. We're not even around yet. Um, it, uh, Erica, you're going to have to tell me which um, hominids they would see or okay. uh, yeah, uh, okay. what, what you're kind right. of monkeys would have been around. To be seen. Homo habilis and Homo rolfensis, thereabouts. Okay. I think, okay, you're, you are absolutely right. So I, I, I was kind of wrong on that point, but I do think that the seems to me that the, the explanations don't take into account the idea that depending on which direction we look, um, you know, Okay, I guess yeah. Okay, that, that actually that actually does make sense. Yeah. So which, whichever direction we look, things will will appear to be younger. Um. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um. I think this this has I, been I, um 
this has been a, a super enjoyable conversation, but we do, unfortunately, we still have like a lot of other callers on the line and I want to get through okay. as many of them as possible. Maybe you can call again next time. Maybe like what you can do is look, look into some of the stuff that we've talked about today. And then if you, yep. you want to talk to Aaron more, I am sure he will be back. And then you can come back guns blazing with like, ah, I read up on this and I'm ready to, I'm ready to put the challenge, put the thumb screws on him. Does that sound okay? All right. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very Friedman much. Equations so we can discuss those. <laughs> yeah. No, please don't do that. <laughs> bye bye, Anthony. I'm Take sorry. Care. Thank you. Come on, uh, come on. More math, more all the time. <laughs> no, less. Less math, less physics, less chemistry, more squishy biology. <laughs> I thought that was a, a productive conversation. I learned a lot, actually. I every time we were on here, Aaron, I learned a lot because my my cosmology is not great. So I appreciated that, like seriously. I'm all right. What do glad we I could also call on you to remember who we might have, who the Andromedans might be looking at right now. They're not looking at us. They're looking at our great, 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 great grandfather. Can I tell you how jealous I am of them? What I would give to take a stroll with Homo habilis. Oh my gosh, that would be the most epic thing of all time. Um, all right, going down the list. Now, I, I'm going to kind of uh, uh, tease you a little bit here, Aaron, because way down on the list, the most recent caller who will be at present the last one that we get to wants to talk about dark matter. And I know that you're excited about that. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind and hope that Raymond, pronounce he him from Florida, who is a theist, stays on to discuss dark matter with you. Uh, but first, we have J. Pluto. Oh, I've talked to J. Pluto before. Pronounce he in from Georgia. Uh, atheist wants to discuss secularism and the mischaracterization of secular beliefs in Christian education. I remember J. Pluto. J. Pluto had to talk about intelligent design at school. J., you are on Skep Talk. How are you doing? And can you hear Hello, us? Hello, I'm doing really well. Can you all hear me? Wonderful. Yes, we can. Coming in loud and clear. Oh. Hmm. Sorry, I, I should have said this. Tell us a little bit more about your question. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, in my, um, worldview class at school, we recently did the unit on secularism as like a worldview. Um, and there was like a lot of stuff in there that they got wrong because in the, um, like the book, the book, the textbook that we're using, like openly admitted to being biased, um, towards Christianity and was kind of like biased against other stuff. Um, but yeah, it's um there's a lot of stuff that they got wrong and I have notes on it. <laughs> so what what's the number one thing that you felt they they botched that you would like to pose to us tonight? Well, okay. So the first thing that they that I think they got wrong, like the biggest thing is that they were talking about how um secularism is a religion. Um <laughs> And also, they said some stuff about, like, propaganda, with air quotes, um, uh, saying, like, um, this is an actual quote from my teacher um, that, I, that I wrote down during class. If you disagree with climate change, you're called ignorant or uneducated for disagreeing with the propaganda. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, and yeah. they also, like, in the book, they, like, grossly mischaracterized, like, um, secular beliefs, and they tried to excuse it with, with saying, like, in um, parentheses before they said the gross m mischaracterization, they tried to excuse it by saying exaggerated to make a point, but the exaggeration removes it so far from the original context that it's no longer... Um, an actual uh, summary of what secular secular people believe. So, with any any of those topics seem interesting off the bat. Aaron, would any of those tickling your fancy? I I think it's funny that secularism is a religion. That's that's the one that I find um, kind of goofy. I, I wasn't aware that I, a lot of people who who actually hold varying religions practice the religion of secularism when they do things that aren't within their religion. That I, that's news to me. 
Oh, oh, no, that's totally legit. Like, just like how my family um, every year celebrates uh, the secular holiday of Festivus. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, we do. Um, I, uh, I've said this on my channel before, but we do annual pilgrimages to see the little Purgatorius or Morganukadon golden statue at the um, at the Smithsonian to praise our ancestors. That's what true secularists do. Say three Hail Darwins, you know? Yeah, that's that's just a goofy concept, right? I mean, secularism is yeah. just like it's not. It, it doesn't meet any of the criteria that we typically consider for religion. And the only reason that I feel some religious folks do this, and I mean, let's be honest here, it's evangelical Christians who are mostly doing it here in the West, is to try to pull everything down to the same level. It is analogous to when Ken Ham will be like, oh, we're, we're looking at the same evidence. We're just coming away with, you know, with it, with different interpretations from it. I mean, that's basically like saying a flat earther and someone who accepts conventional science are coming away from the evidence with, this, with just different interpretations. Some interpretations are, insofar as we can understand them, objectively incorrect. And a great example is what you just mentioned with, with the, the climate change quote-unquote propaganda. I mean, I, I'm sure they didn't dig into it very much because then they, they would get, them into, get themselves into the nasty pickle that is trying to explain how all the data is wrong. <laughs> well, as you know, uh, thermometers are... Um, you know, they, they just have this massive propaganda network. You know, Mercury must big always Mercury. go up. Uh, that's their slogan. Yeah, big Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Thermometers are liberals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is surprising well, I mean, because they're usually, you know, uh, red. So uh, you'd think they'd be more red state active, but yeah. <laughs> you, you would think so. I mean, like, we, we could sit here and talk forever about, like, the, 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 the fact that the climate is changing and all of the various support for that, um, whether we're talking about like ecosystem responses, how much sea ice is coming and going every year, comparison to previous uh, temperature uh, regulars in the, in the ice cores, right? Like however we want to do it. But the bottom line is, is that based off of what they're saying, right? Like none of that matters because the, the premise itself is false. Like secularism is not a thing that is recognized by anyone outside of the people teaching that unit at your school and who also teach it presumably elsewhere. I mean, I remember, I don't think we had secularism as one of them, but it was like existentialism, nihilism, humanism, and all of these are bad because they aren't our ism, um, which is goofy and, and makes absolutely no coherent sense with how we understand things. Um, so your intuition on that one was correct, J. Pluto. The, that is um, not an accurate statement. <laughs> Yeah, um, they also said that, like, in the textbook, they said that uh, secularists have faith in the scientific method, the theory of naturalistic evolution, materialism, what they consider to be reasoned arguments that are self-evident to all who are not deluded by their faith and their own human capacities. Like, do they have faith, faith in those in the things? scientific method, like it's our Ten Commandments. I mean, people, again, people of all stripes, religious, irreligious, from all across the world practice the scientific method. It's just a means by which we come to know things about the natural world around us, right? Like, is it, would you call it like having a, enjoying breakfast every day? Would you call that breakfastism because it's a ritual that you, that you do every morning? No, I mean, is this, it's like, I, I don't like. What do you even say about this, Aaron? Help me out here. Like, what what do you do with that? How do you debunk something so silly? Uh, well, I think of the T-shirt, which, funny enough, actually was a picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and then the caption mm -hmm. is "Science, it works, bitches." <laughs> yeah. And I think we can just leave it at that. The fact it works should be enough reason to say, if we're going to call it faith, we're going to say, well, it's faith that works. Can all right? So let's put it this way. We can talk about faith in medicine and see how many lives are saved. We can talk about then faith in uh, um, faith healers and see what their record are and how many hospitals run on them. Oh, none? Well, I think we Crazy. know who wins this round. <laughs> well, it's it's also not even like, I hate the characterization that, that they're kind of creating here where it's like, oh, only the evil secularist scientists use the scientific method. No, are you kidding me? But plenty of religious people do science all the time. Some of them have done phenomenal science that have changed the way that we've been, you know, able to do therefore more science building on top of that, right? Like this is not, oh, yeah. they're just trying to find things that sound um, like they're trying to take characteristics that they feel like they can group together in like the most stereotypical, like atheist person of all time, and then call that a part of a religion. 
this is a, you could yeah. you're just they're just making things up at that point like you know you, anybody can do that in fact i'm going to throw in an extra complication because uh this will make things even more fun so they can get away with this because of the squishiness of the word religion and the people who actually study religion um have come to the conclusion that religion uh doesn't exist in that there isn't like one coherent definition that seems to work in all cases uh and that idea that is commonly considered religion is actually a uh early modern european invention uh that comes out of protestant christianity then forced onto basically the rest of the world to make it fit that paradigm uh there's one of the books i have here by brent nogbury called before religion kind of summarizing uh that general history that if you go back to ancient greece ancient hebrew ancient um uh, Hindu, uh, Chinese, things like that. They don't even have the word religion. Uh, it's not an indigenous word even there. And that when religion is being used and it's like taken from a Latin root to basically talk about like customs, uh, it's then kind of like reimagined and then forced onto all these other, um, cultures in, uh, basically one of the outlandish uh, effects of, uh, old timey colonialism. So what is religion? It's what a bunch of Protestants made up at one time, and that we're still kind of scratching our heads wondering what the heck just happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great summary. Jay, does that, um, Jay Plutus, does that like answer? Your, I mean, I know it wasn't really like a question, but was that a, was that a sufficient musing, do you think, between the two of us? Yeah, I, I think that that was really, yeah. Um, uh, because I was just thinking, while you were talking about that, because I added on, because in the thing that I read something out loud from just a moment ago, I w it was like a um, reading comprehension thing. I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, in the reading comprehension thing, um, I was like really insistent on like not answering directly from the book because the book is like really stupid and says a lot of wrong things um and so i added my own little spin on it i guess um and after i wrote the bit that says that like secularists have faith in the scientific method um, I said, like, this being despite the fact that faith in a religious sense refers to a belief that is unfalsifiable and therefore cannot be proven wrong, which means it cannot, it cannot be tested and is thus ruled out of science. So the use of faith in this context, in the context of the textbook, is silly. The book claimed that secularism rejects anything that is outside of the realm of science, and therefore it cannot also claim that they are accepting ideas outside of the realm of science. It's like a little internal contradiction, little switcheroo that they did. Um, Whoa, and I they think also, that's an entirely appropriate answer. I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they also said that um, uh, secularism, since it's like, quote unquote, materialistic, it's like rejecting everything outside the realm of science. And they're talking about like... Uh, concepts that are not of the material world like fascination sense of wonder creativity motivation determination curiosity humor beauty compassion enthusiasm imagination memories value of life infinity origin purpose morality destiny and some aspects of identity they're saying like pure secularists would have to reject these things existing since they can't be measured by science um, no, I was just psychologists who study this on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, I was. Oh, beauty, uh, uh shoot, yeah. gotta reject beauty. Dang, can't can't enjoy art because I'm I'm a I'm a secularist. Shoot, shoot. You have to you have to reject compassion. That's crazy. No compassion, no morality for me. Even though, only I mean, I I can't remember every single one of the ones that you just mentioned, but everything that I'm thinking of nope. now can be found in other organisms, at least to, to an extent, right? Um, to say that yeah. other animals no, have no morality or no sense of, of purpose or wonder or curiosity is the dumbest thing I've ever heard and, and completely baseless. Um, I wonder if you yeah. ask your teacher, hey, look, what is a religion? Like, can we define a religion? And then when they define it, be like, okay, either, either secularism does not count or it does, and so does everything else. 
like everything else, right? Like that, that's just, I, I don't know. I wonder what would happen if you, if you ask them that. I don't know if you'd be able to do that, but I'd be interested to hear the response. Um, yeah, but also, um, you said no creativity, Erica, no more drawing, no more drawing. No more drawing, can't enjoy any, any to, music that I like to listen to, no, no that, enjoying monkey videos. Delete that animation that you uploaded recently. <laughs> you gotta get rid of it, you're a secularist. It was all, it was all a fugue state, I wasn't actually enjoying it, uh, because enjoyment too is also <laughs> outside of the secularist religion. That's so silly. I'm sorry you have to go through that. That's got to be um, a very frustrating class to take, and I use those words loosely. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really annoying because from apparently what I've heard, like um, almost every little minute thing that they've said in that class is like wrong or like misrepresenting stuff. I mean, like. I already expected as much because we had a um, unit before secularism on Islam, and if you know fundamentalist Christianity, the very first thing that they talked about in the chapter on Islam was terrorists, which is yeah, um, totally honest representation. But um, I not a measure like literally. From That's crazy. That's totally not what I would expect. <laughs> Yeah, um, but, like, I literally, like, joined a Discord server for, like, people who have questions about Islam, and I, like, sent, like, pictures of every <laughs> single page in that chapter to the people there, and, like, I got, like, somebody who did, like, a really long response to every single thing that they got wrong, and it was, like, when I, like, I took a screen video of me scrolling through and it was like a minute and a half long and like every oh other goodness. paragraph started with this is wrong yeah i i don't find that surprising i mean i i remember i think i mentioned this last time we spoke but i i took a world world views class when i was in middle school and i, I went to a, a young earth creationist middle school so this was a, our our worldview class how we learn about who thinks differently than us and it was it, it is a little bit different, but very much in the same spirit of what you've mentioned here, where it's just like every single, every single thing and, and way of thinking that isn't us. If it's not, if it's not just, oh, it's, it's so sad, it's untrue, and they haven't seen the light of our belief system, then it's like, oh, it's outright evil, and there isn't a single redeeming quality to it. And I explicitly remember that was the attitude that they took when tackling non-evangelical Christian religions like Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, like with the religious aspects to it, um, which was, you know, I don't know. I, that just is exhausting. I wish someone would, who will step up and <laughs> think of the children and keep everybody safe from this kind of thinking. But, you know, I don't know. The, the best you can do is be a light in the class to, uh, to other people who are, are kind of probably internally thinking the same as you, you know, and, and challenge your teacher. <laughs> Do it as much as yeah. you can. Don't put your grade in jeopardy. You know, you you don't don't get uh don't get busted up for such a silly class, but Yeah. Um well Did I'd love Pluto? to talk more, but yeah. Yeah. It's late and my gonna... sister has to go to bed. Oh man. Well thank you so much for calling in. This was a, a wonderful chat and best of luck. I'm sure we'll speak again sometime. Yeah. I'll talk to you again, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Take care. Oh man, that's so brutal. I I sympathize with that. I really do. I and it sucks too when you're that age as well because it's it doesn't seem like it's as easy to like stand up to people who are these like authority figures who do not know as much as they think they know. And it just kills so many other things. Like when they said like if you're a secularist or a science person, you don't have any concept of beauty because you can't measure it, so it doesn't exist. Well. There's literally an entire science exploring what makes things beautiful. And I mean, sure, at the top is my wife, and then there's all the other things. But nonetheless, <laughs> it's an actual approachable scientific question. And if you throw that out there and just say, why are things beautiful? Uh, God did it and God said it. That just always stifles so much we could learn. And of course, I also find learning things a beautiful thing in itself. So I guess for me to be a good scientist, I can't have curiosity, which kills science, so no science. Oh man, this Ouroboros, it just keeps biting itself. 
<laughs> yeah, we we were doomed from the start. I yeah, I know. One of the the yeah. curiosity one was like, what? Are we, like are you actually telling me that other animals aren't curious? Like they don't engage in science in the way that we engage in science and what we're to expect they have zero curiosity like that's just or morality or uh, compassion for one another like i that's just like brutally incorrect yeah. and and like you, you know we talk about how like science a lot of the time goes against our common sense every now and again there's something that your common sense is just like it is so evident that you're like no one in their right mind would actually posit this who hung out with any animals or observed any other critters at any it's just crazy crazy to me yeah, it also it also reminds me that like if we're going to look for religion for curiosity, well, I'm sorry that in the uh, medieval Christian tradition, curiosity was basically considered a sin. It was a pathway to heresy. So uh, uh, you basically had to, in many ways, I imagine the medieval church similar to um, Bobby Boucher's, uh, Boucher's mother from The Water Boy, just completely yeah, blocked out yeah, the rest yeah, of the yeah. world, uh, just saying, and just anything else is of the devil. <laughs> Anything, yeah, yeah. Any anything else that's the devil's work, devil's hands, man. That's brutal. Yeah, mama well, told me. Mama has told me, ain't got a toothbrush. That's why it's so ornery. So our next question. Oh, I'm psyched for this one. All right, this one that you know, this one's for me. Don't worry, Raymond T. Him from Florida is still present. He wants to talk about dark matter, but this next one is all mm -hmm. mine. Brandy, pronoun she, her from Massachusetts. She's an atheist, and she's asking, why did gray wolves domesticate with modern humans, but not other cousins like Denisovans or Homo neanderthalensis? So, Brandy, you are on Skep Talk. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you for taking my call and my question. It is nice Wonderful. to be on with you, Erica. But, yes, I'm, you're totally going to relate with this question. It has this question has been rattling around in my skull for a few years now. I've been studying hominid evolution since 2013, 2014, 2013, that yeah. time. And yeah. So I got, I have a bachelor's degree in anthropology with a concentration on hominid oh, evolution. Awesome. And so this question, right? So are anatomically modern humans, we venture out of Africa somewhere 75 to 55,000 years ago. We start exploring what today we call Europe and Asia, right? And then mm -hmm. somewhere between 50 and 30,000 years ago, domestication of gray wolves occur. Like, and it, we take credit for it, of course. But the of areas, course. and this is what the areas that it came up where they've come up with, like northern China and some places in Europe, where these gray wolves start to become domesticated within that time zone, according to the fossil record we have, right? And yes. in those areas, like Denisovans, we don't know much about their culture because we have little to go on for their culture, but. Neanderthals, we got plenty about their culture. And they've lived in what we call Europe today or in the steppe area of Eurasia for hundreds of thousands of years. And they've been hunting and gathering and having this rich, lively culture for hundreds of thousands of years. But they didn't seem to incorporate or domesticate gray wolves or gray wolves didn't incorporate themselves into their culture but why our ancestry culture have you ever pondered that question you know it's it's actually so it's so coincidental that you asked this because i've been working on this video it's finished it's uploaded it's it's set to release here soon um on the domestication of dogs because i did a video on it a long time ago and it was the first video of mine that ever got any attention like that was just like a, a video on education rather than like hi here's me duking it out with creationists again um, and I wanted to remake that because I've learned a lot since I made that video. And then I also just want to make it with better audio and visuals and things like that. And so it's been, it's been like on my mind very recently as I scripted it and, and filmed it and things like that to the degree that directly right in front of me, I have one of my sources, which you would probably really enjoy the invaders by Pat Shipman and, um, Shipman makes a really interesting argument to, to answer that exact question. And I find it compelling because I also was like, I have no idea, like Neanderthals to our understanding, were ridiculously capable. I mean, they did almost everything we did, used many of the same tools, were capable of founding much of the same game. Um, there, there's some folks who propose that they were even capable of like, like 
essentially using seafaring vessels and things of that nature. They used knots and glue, obviously mastered fire, obviously wore clothes, and even exchanged genes with humans and potentially even exchanged material cultures. So like, why us? Why not them? And the argument that yeah, I, I go make further and argue. That, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to cut you off. But I even go further and argue that Neanderthals were the best hunters that our planet has ever seen, as far as like tool hunting. They were well, amazing they, at hunting. Had, yeah, they had enormous brain case sizes, and those that lived in the north had to feed. You know, they had to eat a couple thousand extra calories per day because their brains had. No, it was roughly 400 cc's at the maximum larger than humans and they had heavier set bodies as well so they needed so many calories every day to eat and they lived in an area where for much of the year there was nothing to gather so they just they had to hunt all the time it characterizes being like hyper carnivorous and maybe even specializing in eating um the, the organs that were more nutritious and metabolically beneficial as opposed to like raw meat males and females both have similar wounds on their bodies like that mostly look like rodeo rider wounds that we see today that's the most analogous modern pathology which suggests that both sexes were involved in in hunting because they had to be because it was like your little tribe is made of eight nine people maybe it's like some of you have kids like you, it's going to take a lot of people to bring down a woolly rhino um and we know this is part of the argument right because we know that that late surviving neanderthalensis was pretty inbred. Their group size was pretty small, especially compared to what we see um, in anatomically modern humans as we come out of Africa in these waves and eventually come to, as you said, what we now consider um, Europe. But Shipman argues that, that it was a combination of two things, right? Human sociality and wolf sociality map more directly onto one another. We live in, we both live in larger groups than what we tend to see in Neanderthals. We both pack hunt using um, communication strategies that are proposed to have differed slightly from Neanderthals, just given the, the patterns of prey that Homo sapiens was regularly taking down. The argument goes that we, mo we went over like really exceptionally large game more often. Um, and whether that's because we had better weapons for, for dealing with them, I don't really buy that. But I think it's probably more likely the second proposal, which is that we went after a larger game because we had more mouths to feed, right? We've got a, a tribe of maybe 50. So it's, it's much more advantageous for us to, to say, okay, we're going to go after one mammoth than, you know, 10 deer or something like that. Um, and because we were going after a larger game, which wolves were previously dominating along with cave hyenas because they had so many in their groups, Shipman argues that that would have put us in one another's paths more often. So we hunt mammoth, they hunt mammoth. We're trying to guard our kills from them. They're trying to guard our kills from us. And the secondary argument goes is that because Neanderthals evolved in Europe, they recognized wolves from the very beginning as a, an enemy, a competitor in the, in the carnivore guild that is not something worth allying with. And what that would mean is that when lone wolves, as they left their natal packs, would approach Neanderthal settlements, Neanderthals wouldn't tolerate them ever. Homo sapiens came from Africa, where there are zero pack hunting canines, right? There's none. It's, you've got hyenas that hunt in clans, and then you've got uh, lions and prides, and then you've dole, but they're solitary. Right? And the argument goes that we came from, from East Africa, not South Africa, where you can regularly find wild dogs. So Shipman argues that it's a combination of meeting each other more often and the novelty in seeing wolves because we, we didn't have them. It was the only animal that has no analog in Africa for Homo sapiens, right? We had hairless, hair, uh, hairless uh, um, mammoths in the form of elephants. We had hairless rhinos. We had big cats in Africa. We had little tiny dogs in Africa. We had every kind of big horned thing that you could hunt and eat that, that you could imagine, but no social canine. So the idea was that it was just like a, a perfect mixture. And the, the flight distance hypothesis, I think, makes the most sense where it's like these lone wolves, as they leave their natal groups, they smell human kills. They're, they're, um, they're young. They don't recognize humans necessarily as, um, as a threat. And if they approached a Neanderthal settlement, they probably would have been killed outright because Neanderthals have known for, as you said, hundreds of thousands of years that these guys are predators. They are bad. They are competitors and they'll kill you. But in the case of humans, it could be because, as you said, the range for domestication is roughly between 40 and 27,000 years ago. That's fast, right? And apparently there were several aborted domestication events where we find these things that look like wolf dogs right? Things that are kind of, you know, called paleolithic dogs. They look more like modern dogs than they look like ancient wolves. And we test their DNA and they're not related to any modern dog, suggesting that multiple humans, some in Europe, some in China, attempted this relationship. 
And it might just, you know, the, the argument too with transketolase like one is that humans have a, a slightly more innovative edge as compared to Neanderthal. And this gene emerged, I think it's roughly like 120,000 years ago as well. So it it's, might have genuinely been a combination of predisposition and novelty on the part of humans and on the part of wolves, something that never even stood a chance with Neanderthals, even if they had the predisposition because the novelty wasn't there. Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. It's like you laid down a few puzzle pieces I've been looking for. Yes, totally. That's so good but, to yeah, hear. The first, part of the, argument, <laughs> the first part of the argument that we were the ones getting the bigger and larger prey, I, that don't really hold up to the evidence. Neanderthals were plenty capable and did take down is selective certainly large people, whatever they wanted to. And but yes, certainly as far as Neanderthals would have been frightened to connect with wolves and wolves would have been frightened to connect with Neanderthals. Yes, and their tool set would have been steady for hundreds of thousands of years, so they wouldn't have needed the wolf pack. But these Homo sapiens coming up with their projectiles that weren't as effective getting into the steppe as Neanderthal hunting was. They needed to find new hunting patterns. So them teaming up with the wolves and the wolves teaming, oh my goodness. Yes, them not being afraid of the wolves makes so much sense. My goodness. <laughs> that, I found I it like to be a compelling argument as well. Yeah, I, I, I can't recommend yeah, Shipman's uh, book, book enough. It's really good. It's, a good. it's a good read. She also has another one where she compares um, dingoes modern dingoes as to like paleolithic dogs as being like this pseudo intermediate stage that you know obviously isn't literally an intermediate but it's an analog for what the intermediate was because dingoes work side by side with with aboriginal people in australia but aboriginal people do not selectively breed dingoes right they they get them from their dens raise them and then if the dingo decides to leave it'll leave but half the time they stay and then the dingo just grows up and works side by side with aboriginal people doing the things that they do. And they're like to the degree where the dingo will get severe separation anxiety if taken away from the humans that it's that it's grown up with. And so Shipman argues that like it, it might be an interesting analog for like these early Paleolithic dogs that we basically came to depend on one another. Which is really cool, right? Like I, I think it's awesome. I think that's awesome. Too. I'm curious to know how far back that relationship goes because we know that evidence of homo sapiens sapien in that area would have been about 62,000 years ago, right? In that area? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Thereabouts. Anyways, was that, did that relationship answer your happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it answered my question. Now it raises a few more, but oh my goodness. Yes, you, you totally opened my eyes to a few practices I really want to look into, and I'm going to look Wonderful. into her book. What is it called? Yes. This one, the one that I just read, is called The Invaders. And then she has another one that came out after this, and I, but I forget that name because I don't have it in front of me. It's over there somewhere. I'll look into it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brandy. What a, what a fun topic. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you, Erica. You rock. I'm a oh, big th fan. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. All right, sorry. Sorry, Aaron. I had to go hard on that. I, that's, that's so fresh in my brain right now. I was like, oh my gosh, this, that's such a, a fun and apropos question. So, but now it's your turn because we have the dark matter guest still on the line waiting to call in. So, Raymond. All right. We almost caught you. Raymond, pronounce he, him from Florida. He's a theist. He wants to mm -hmm. ask about dark matter. He's proposing that empirical evidence shows that it doesn't align with the theory. He wants to discuss the contradiction in general. Raymond, welcome to Skep Talk. Would you like to elaborate on your question a little bit? Hello, uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I actually thought of a better question. This is um, skepticism versus religion, or I guess theism versus atheism in a way, right? Sure characterize it that way okay i was going by the uh the youtube title but okay so i actually have a better question for i thought of a better question so i'm sure you guys have heard of the unmoved mover argument this this relates to cosmology and it relates to uh, skepticism and atheism and all of that so I'm sure you guys have heard of the unmoved mover correct 
Um, I you're talking about the I, concept I, from Aristotle and then on down. Um, so basically, if you have given like just given logic and given the laws of thermodynamics and given the expansion of the universe, um, which is dark energy actually. You, you have, and given the Big Bang models, let's just start with the Big Bang model. So you start with uh, the expansion and then the Big Bang, and because of entropy and because of the second law of thermodynamics, over time, things start to cool down, and eventually you have the heat death of the universe. So you see there's a, uh, assuming linear time, you have a, a progression, you have a starting point Raymond, and you have a progression. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to ask you, are you driving by chance right now? No, I'm not. Okay, there's a little bit of feedback coming from, from your end. It almost sounds like you're outside. There's like a like wind or something like that. And I think it's making it a uh, little sorry, hard to hear. Probably, can you hear me better now? Yes, that's much oh, that's better. better. Okay, sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. All right, but, no, that's okay. So just given um, the expansion of the Big Bang, and we have like... You can see if time progresses linearly, we have the starting point of the Big Bang, and we have the dissipation of heat, the second law, entropy increasing, and you eventually have the heat death of the universe, right? So just to lay that out. So from that, we can clearly see that there's a beginning point of the universe. There's a point at which, and given the nature of the laws of physics, once the universe comes into existence, entropy will increase over time. So there's that linear progression. So there had to have been a starting point. And because of the, the rule of cause and effect and just basically the way logic works, in order, if there's a starting point, like there needed to be something to start it. There needed to be a cause. And in philosophy, you can call that like the unmoved mover. And this would be an argument in favor for um, religion. And that not necessarily that it's a Christian God, but that there's some kind of thing that's outside of the universe that did that initiation um, because there's no other explanation for that, unless you can provide another explanation. Okay, interesting when you say that we can get to there from logic because the, uh, I believe the phrase unmoved mover comes from Aristotle, though I'd have to triple check if he originated or if it was from pre-Socratic that he's working from. But nonetheless, uh, when Aristotle was using those sorts of ideas, it was part of his arguments as well that the universe is infinite in time in both past and future. So when Aristotle had this same uh, argument I'm, I'm in mind, making, I'm, making the argument, finite I'm, I'm just, just going to make the argument that, that you can't I'm say making, I logic. So we, ahead, you guys ahead. are talking about, let's, let's let, let's, I mean, okay. Raymond, go ahead and go ahead and clarify. And then we're going to toss back to Aaron. Okay, so I'm just going to make the argument I'm making. I'm not, I'm not uh, for argument's sake, I'm not making any reference to, this is my own original argument. I'm not making reference to anything else. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, well, like I say, um, those who have tried to say, logically, it must be the case that the universe started at a finite period of time in the past has not really won the day in philosoph uh, philosophical circles, Literally, the idea of the unmoved mover from Aristotle would suggest a universe that has always existed and always will exist. So, past eternal and past uh, and future eternal universe, wow. rather than one at some point in the past. Um, and the various ways to say that somehow it's logically necessary or metaphysically necessary, from what I can tell, has not really borne itself Ooh. out. So, that, can you, so if you want to just say give, give it, give it that way. It doesn't work. So given, given the, uh, the second law of thermodynamics and the increase in entropy over time, and that's, that's something that we've uh, witnessed in the universe, and we've never seen that not happen. It always happens, and it never doesn't happen. And we, we, we see linear time. I mean, if you want to argue for nonlinear time, or if you want to argue that the laws of physics were different at the beginning of the universe, that is, those are two um, alternatives that would actually uh, maybe explain away what I'm saying. But if you assume linear time and you assume the second law of thermodynamics, it logically follows that there had to have been a starting point, and we have been progressing from that point onward. Not only the expansion of the universe, but the, uh, the entropy increasing and so on and so on. It's like, so there had to well, have as been... As you say, though, um, 
here's the thing though you can have this increase in entropy go on indefinitely in the future and in the past so long as there are more and more possible states for the universe to um quote unquote decay into to very powerfully use the uh, colloquial way of referring to the second law. So just for the sake of the audience, the second law of thermodynamics, this is the thing that is talking about the measurement of entropy and that entropy in a closed system um, will always either remain the same or increase. It never uh, spontaneously de decreases with any macroscopically large object like um, a box of gas or something even bigger, like a really big box of gas or even bigger, like a whole universe, which is pretty big. Um, but okay. all of okay, that but, requires but I is don't, that I don't think Mr. Raymond, yeah. Hey Raymond, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go and let uh, Aaron finish because he was on a train of thought. We'll get back to you in just one sec. Go ahead. Yeah. So for the thermo for this law to continue to persist, all it needs is that there are more and more possible um, states for it to basically decay into. The whole reason the th second, thermal, second law of thermodynamics exists is it's counting what are called microstates, the different ways that uh, molecules could, for example, arrange themselves. And they're more likely to arrange in ways that are more numerous than, than are less numerous, just by pure probability. Now, here's the thing. If you have a universe that's expanding, there are more and more places for, say, gas to expand into and other states that it can achieve. So what if you had some sort of system that is, I don't know, continuously producing universes where um, things are constantly growing and emerging from, which is actually something you get from the standard version of cosmic inflation that is continuously producing more and more universes so that our universe would seem to like have some sort of interesting initial start point, but it's basically emerging from an earlier state, which itself emerged from an earlier state. And because um, these states are continuously growing out in this process, uh, entry can always be increasing in the future and always be decreasing in the past. Now, if you don't like that, um, I could also introduce you to a different model that was put forward by Sean Carroll and one of his graduate students, uh, something Chen, where they basically had it so that at the Big Bang point, at the uh, early moment of our universe, you basically have the arrow of time going in two directions at once. So basically, entropy is still continuing to decrease into the past from our point of view, but in the other universe where the arrow of time points the other direction, everything seems normal to them and our arrow of time is backwards and entropy is decreasing for them. So that actually you have this consistent way of having this sort of cosmology and taking very seriously this issue of the second law. Um, and so this is something that is uh, one of the cosmological models out there um, built strictly from uh, accounting for the arrow of time or the second law of thermodynamics and it has a past eternal kind of universe okay so i i don't think that an infinite past is logically possible um i would like you to do you, do you is, think are you an infinite future is logically possible but in, an infinite future doesn't necessarily imply an infinite past it's a uh, two arrows. Well, I'm just saying, you're just saying one is logically point. impossible. I'm trying to see what you think is also logically possible or impossible. Yeah, I think that you can only have an infinite past with a some kind of form of nonlinear time. But um, from what we can tell, well, we just again, have I'm time. going to point out that you're saying this is logical. So can you lay out a logical argument? Can you do like modus ponens, and so I can go oh, yeah, premise one, it's, premise two, conclusion. Sure. So if, if there was such a thing as an infinite past, you would need an infinite amount of time to progress to get to the present. But you can't, Done. You can't progress through infinity. Why not? Because it would take an infinite amount of time. I got an infinite amount of time. You just told me. There we go. Problem solved. <laughs> no, but you, you can't. Okay, so it's like a point. You, you can't go beyond infinity because it would take an infinite amount of time. You, you just can't do it, so... I'm not going to be on infinity. It's, you, just, you're saying, it's just continuously there. No, no, well, infinite past. So, like, an infinite future, you can use the argument of it's just continuously there. But, like, for an infinite past, you need, you need there to be a progression through time. And in order to get anywhere, you would need... Because I could say, okay, I could say what happened 100 years ago you know, in 1900, you can keep going back further and further and further infinity, 
And if you reverse that, you can never you can never progress forward in time because you would need an infinite here's amount of time to progress. Well, here's the thing, though. By using that same logic, there must be a largest negative number because otherwise, how did we progress across all an infinite number of negative numbers? So could you tell me what the biggest negative number is? Yeah, I don't know, but it, I mean, basic logic that in it order to make sense. There is no, we traverse, there is no in order biggest to traverse an number. infinite distance, in, or, in order to traverse, how do you traverse an infinite distance? Assuming linearity, well, you you would have to assume nonlinear. What's the Again, maximum you keep amount saying of assume linear? But oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, what's I, no? I was just going to say, like, I, I I think the problem is you you you're thinking of it like there's like a time frame. That the origin of all time, right? Like, what what if it extends infinitely in both directions? In, in the same way that you could say there's a there's an infinite amount of travel that you could do on Earth if you had a, if the Earth existed infinitely and you had a car with an infinite amount of gas, you could just keep looping over and over and over again. Or you could say, okay, from this time period, I traveled from you know New York to LA, right? Like, I, I don't understand logically why you feel like you can't travel infinite, like because what. What Aaron said is true. If you have like a, a perfect you know, grid, right? You're just looking at a basic graph that extends positively and negatively in four quadrants. Okay, so right? what what about think, negative? Sure, I, I, get, I get what mean? you're saying. I, I get I get what you're saying. I don't think that I think that infinity uh, infinite past in theory you can maybe kind of make it seem like it makes sense, but in in reality it just a linear progression of time and an infinite past seem inherently contradictory to me. If that isn't the case, wait, I wait, 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 I need to pause you there. No, no, let me, you let me say that point. Let me, what, but you so, actually conceded and you also contradicted yourself. So hold on, Raymond, just, just a quick second. We need to make sure that Aaron knows where you're coming from here and that we're going to let him talk and then we're going to let you clarify your point and then we'll go back to him again. So go ahead, Aaron. So the thing that's confusing me is you're saying you can have a model, but you're saying it's also logically incoherent. If it's logically incoherent, you couldn't possibly have a consistent model. So this seems like you're contradicting yourself to no. say that there's an inherent no, I, I, logical I'm, possibility I'm, here. No, I'm conceding. I, I, I fundamentally disagree with you, and I don't think you... We're just not on the same page, so I'm just conceding the point so we can move forward because I have a separate point that I can make. Okay. So have you ever... Is there any evidence to support the idea that at some point you go from like um, very low entropy, like the beginning stages of the universe to you can call it medium, wherever we are now to like the heat death. And then there's another universe that somehow comes out of that heat death. And is, is there any actual scientific reason to believe that that's real? Not only some kind of theoretical model, but actual physical evidence. Isn't Hawking radiation the point for that? Am I, am I completely pulling that out of my ass here? Or is Hawking I radiation? Think, um, I don't think Hawking radiation will help answer this question. I don't think it, re I don't think it relevantly touches it, but um, here's a few things that we could have. Um, a few of them that might break your brain. Have you ever heard of a Boltzmann brain? Oh, this one's crazy. No. I, 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 All it right, seems so, vaguely familiar, but not. No. Okay. So, um, this is a uh, little thought experiment of, you know, taking the idea of, for example, like, you know, the infinite monkeys on infinite typewriters eventually typing Shakespeare. Um, mm. If you are given an infinite amount of time and you got the material sitting around, you know, eventually things can like just randomly coalesce into very complex structures, including uh, cells animals, whole planets, but more likely it, the minimum amount of thing that you would need to like magically coalesce in one go that could still perceive the world would be a brain. And if there's an infinite amount of time for this universe to happen, how do we make sure that there are not these things that would be called Boltzmann brains? So just given random fluctuations in the leftover gas of the universe happens to just randomly fluctuate into a brain. And while this is absurdly improbable, take any absurdly small number multiply it by infinity, and it becomes uh, a guaranteed thing to have happened an infinite number of times. So the, the problem with that is that if your model allows well, for this to happen, well, no. how do you make sure you're not a Boltzmann brain? Yeah. <laughs> moment to moment, even. Yeah, I mean, thought. yeah, e even logically, if even if there's a one in a 0.00 to 
an almost infinite amount of zeros, point, you know, one, if there's any probability whatsoever, even the slightest, given an infinite amount of time, it will happen. That is yes. a, uh, that's a, that's an implication. So, um, I do agree with that, but just, but you have to, um, fulfill the requirement that it is a, there is some probability of it happening. And then given infinite time, it will happen. Well, well so but it is, but I don't think that you possible would happen. happen. Yeah, can can it happen? So like, let's say you know, your your brain, Raymond, is like a series of electrical impulses, right? Like any given any. I shouldn't say that. I'm not saying like there's literally not a shot that there's there's anything more to it than that. But I think we can at least agree that at any given moment, your brain has taken on a state of like electrical impulses that theoretically you could take a snapshot of and represent quantitatively, right? If what Aaron has said is true, right? And like we progress to the heat death of the universe. That pattern Something may repeat positive. itself. Yeah, that pattern might repeat itself given that infinite amount of time, right? It's just it's just electrical impulses, right? So if that were to happen, then the Boltzmann brain is logically possible. It is it is a logical possibility that that could emerge again, dissipate instantly, and you would have no idea because it could be replicating in this exact moment of your perception. That's that's the idea, right? So technically, that is I possible. Understand. So so the idea then is if if like it holds, right? It is logically possible, and we have an infinite amount of time. There's now, no reason to think time is going to stop moving okay, forward. Okay, so I, I I do understand I do understand what you're saying. Um, that does make sense, but you need to have a baseline non-zero positive percent chance. You need to establish that that is the case, and then given infinite time, you have your brain, you have your universe, you have your whatever. But you first need to establish that there's a non-zero positive. Like to give you an example, there's a there's zero point one percent, zero point you know one in a thousand one. There needs to be a positive number there. <laughs> and how do you how do you establish that? So is is oh, there? Oh, I can do that quickly. Um, yeah, you you, just, you got uh, this. How many got, atoms? Yeah, I know. How many uh, how many atoms are in the brain? Um, and then basically have them in the right place in the right arrangement. You can turn that into a number, and of course, it's going to have like you know um, a, a one with who knows how many zeros after that point, uh, one in that gargantuan number. But it's still physically possible, and anything that is possible given infinite time will certainly happen. Do you say it is impossible? Would have to require us to show that it's actually like logically impossible or physically impossible that it actually breaks the laws of physics and it doesn't seem to do that but i think we might have gotten beside our point because i think i failed to answer your original inquiry about our universe then eventually spawning off and creating new universes from the heat death leftovers of it um so there is a model from roger penrose that's supposed to do something with that but i do not know the details to describe it with any fidelity so i won't try to i just know that penrose who is a nobel laureate so he knows a thing or two more about, uh, than me about physics. <laughs> um, I mean, heck, he was Stephen Hawking's teacher, so damn right he's smarter yeah. than me. Um, <laughs> but um, more importantly, the earlier thing I had mentioned about cosmic inflation constantly producing universes, that process is still ongoing indefinitely, so that there are other universes in other separate um, space times developing and spitting off and creating more and more baby universes constantly. Um, that are just you know totally separate from this bubble of universe that we happen to be hanging out in. So um, even if our universe is Real. sterile in some sense, it is not producing anymore. There's still plenty of other universes being popped off continuously in the um, inflationary system. Uh, real quick, so wouldn't if if a universe were to spawn, um, can you quickly just explain how that doesn't violate the first law of thermodynamics, which is that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed? Well, you know what it is. Time for me to blow your mind. How much energy is in the entire universe? I think it's like a net zero or something based off of uh, some random uh, video that I saw. That online. is our current observation. Like, the total <laughs> sum like of energy... Um, Sums up to zero. So, how much energy does it take to start a universe? Apparently, zero. But wouldn't it, why why is it the case that the laws of physics are always the same and they never change? From more of a philosophical perspective, 
I understand from a scientific, it's, it's based on in, inductive reasoning and based on everything that we've observed. That is the case, so therefore we're going with it. But from a more broad philosophical perspective, why, why are the laws of physics consistent? Why didn't you just say that the laws of physics could have just been different during the early expansionary period prior to the Big Bang? Oh, I didn't argue that because I wouldn't have any evidence to show otherwise, and I'd rather rely on things we can demonstrate rather than um, uh, the worst sorts of Hail Marys in doing science. So I'm just sticking with what we can demonstrate and expand from there rather than highly speculative things that are beyond any uh, evidentiary value. So that's just me trying to be a good scientist. Okay, and I think that a scientist should assign some sort of degree of certainty to their ideas, especially when speaking of them publicly, because I mm -hmm. think that there are obviously issues with uh, general relativity, which is seen in dark matter and dark energy, and there, there are issues with, um, like what you're just saying, universes spawning from nowhere, that's, you're saying that that's not speculative, even though, I mean, clearly, to be honest, that, that we don't have an, an we don't have an abundance of evidence to support the idea of universes spawning from nowhere. If anything, it's only happened once, and that's again we don't. So it's not as substantial. So if I may, you know, uh, when it comes to the evidence related to that, um, like I say, it is the outgrowth of the ideas of inflation that, uh, as I mentioned to a previous caller, that Alan Guth came up with, and th that explanation helps explain a number of observations that were otherwise not well explained in the early 1980s. Um, uh, related to the horizon problem and the isotropy problem, the fact that the universe seemed to be so smooth in the uh, cosmic microwave background, even to degrees that you couldn't expect from just uh, everything evenly heating through because the universe was too big for that to have happened in the amount of time allowed. Um, uh, things like that. So the model explains these things, and the model mm -hmm. has these extra predictions about basically it continuously producing more and more universes very naturally. That basically cosmic inflation, which was there to explain observations, has, as a free lunch, the creation of universes continuously. So um, that, of course, is not nearly as well evidence as, say, the Big Bang itself or evolution by natural selection or things like that. It is certainly not as strongly confirmed as these other sorts of things. I mean, I'm not going to put it on the same level as germ theory, hardly. Um, but at the very least, it allows us to say, here's a model. It's consistent with everything we know. and um, because it works so well as is, and we don't see anything that currently contradicts it, there's no reason to abandon it for, um, say, theistic explanations or uh, the like. Okay, yeah, that was basically my only question. That was, uh, All right. yeah, it was a pretty good answer. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Raymond. Appreciate you calling in. Alrighty. Yep. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye, dude. That oh. the Boltzmann brain stuff just absolutely blows my mind every time I hear it. Like it, it makes me feel like I'm stoned out of my gourd, and at the same time, it's like <laughs> it is logically consistent. Like I can't prove that this isn't the the dying memory, like a, a random flushed memory of a universe that's long gone. Spooky. Yeah, um, I would say the thing that can give you some comfort is that the models that have our heat death of the universe would suggest that if Boltzmann brains are created, they are created so rarely, it doesn't become more probable that you are a Boltzmann brain than you're not. So fortunately, um, we have at least some way of having our models tell us, even if Boltzmann brains are possible, they're rare enough that we don't have yeah. to worry. So don't worry, Erica, more likely than not, you're not a Boltzmann brain, you're just a simulation in an alien supercomputer bad video game. Um, with questionable graphics. Here's my whole thing about the simulation, like the, the the sophistry of like, oh, brain in the vat, like things like that. Honestly, it feels real to me, so I don't care. I know maybe that makes me like a, a lame philosophical thinker, but at the same time, it's like, you know what? Like I'm I'm rolling, I don't mind. If it is, then they've, well, I was gonna say they've done a good enough job. They've kind of done a shite job, but at the same time, like to me, it's going all right. So I'll take what I can get. Yeah. Uh, All right, folks. If insofar as those things are there, I try to think about them. Okay, is this the sort of thing that a um, simulator actually would spend compute cycles creating? Because um, to me, it kind of almost creates its own simulation problem of evil. 
if you are true, even just a true. high school student in the in the hyper universe creating these simulations, yeah. would you really create a universe that includes tsunamis, cancer, and the Holocaust? No, that would I make will you a say, moral monster. <laughs> I would say counterpoint. I have seen many of my friend, friends play Sims too, and they are moral monsters. <laughs> so <laughs> that might that might answer your question. I, I, I don't know. They, you know, I mean, I they, they would probably I'm at least say because I've heard people say this that uh, at least they're just saying, hey, it's just computer code. They don't actually feel anything. But the fact that we have sentience, at least I know I do. I'll, 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 I'll assume most other people have sentience as Jury's well. Jury's still out that, on me. Jury's still out. <laughs> yeah. Um, fact of the matter is, I know I have sentience. So someone who's created a universe that includes people like me with sentience that undergo untold suffering is extremely hard to explain. Well, conversely, what would people actually create? Um, basically, giant pleasure simulations, more likely. I mean, they would probably make, you know, really fun video games to play in, rather than other universes where people just suffer and die for reasons. It, it's not the sort of thing that you would necessarily expect from a hyper-advanced civilization capable of doing that. And that even assumes um, that you can have not only <laughs> to make the simulation hypothesis also stronger, the thing that uh, what was it Nick Bostrom had pointed out was that the simulations themselves could be advanced enough to create their own simulations, which then creates mm. kind of like a nesting level of, of so that way it's more likely than not that there would be a simulation than the real ground level universe. But fact of the matter is, Sim so far we haven't down. been able to do it. Yeah, it, it it would mean eventually there could be some bottom level that. At some level, the graphics get so crappy that you can't actually yeah. um, simulate another universe below that. Um, there are other issues as well. The fact is, to create a universe, to create a computer that perfectly simulates the universe, the minimum size it has to be is the universe. <laughs> yeah. So for the simulation hypothesis to work, it also requires basically everything outside of Earth to be completely manufactured and not even there. It's just like some giant screen in, around the uh, Earth that just happens to look exactly like everything the astronomers say, or the universe is rendering just in time when we get there, just like every time I have to my video game have to load when I'm uh, moving from one yeah. zone to the next. <laughs> it's, it becomes it, it's, kind of crazy when you think about it. <laughs> it's all DLC. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get the, the solar system DLC <laughs> before I die, but we'll, uh, we'll see. I mean, I'd like, to, I'd like to see us get past the moon. Like, a human past the moon. I think that would be really epic. But we still have one more caller. And before we oh, take this right. caller, I would like to remind everyone, I don't I haven't been looking. I don't know if you guys have been slacking or not. I'm gonna assume you guys are doing a really good job sending in super chats because super chats keep the light on the lights on here at the line and here at Skeptalk. So send in super chats and ask me and Aaron silly questions if you would like. Okay. Don't forget. Now about on to our next and, uh, and final caller here. We have Michael, pronouns he him from California. He's an atheist and he wants to ask a clarifying question about genetic diversity amongst ethnic groups. So this, this, um, this is gonna be an interesting one. Michael, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, Erica, hey, Aaron. Um, what yeah, y'all are doing it. <laughs> Thank you for uh, yeah, being on here. And also you're just kind of helping us clarify our understanding of stuff. Sometimes, um, so um, yeah. Um, my question is like, um, so I know that like, I read somewhere that's obvious. I read somewhere that they said like, there's more genetic variation within like self-identified racial groups than between them. And then like, okay, I understood like that piece of you know that that that, that kind of fact. And then it kind of like at the same time like, go against my intuition of like the founder effect too. I'm like. You know, how is there more genetic variation within a racial group when some of those racial groups have, are essentially part of that same founding group that, you know, is just re recombining the same essential, you know, genes over again? Like, it almost feels like those two, those two pieces of fact, like those two facts are kind of like contradicting. Yeah, so... so I, mean, um, I'm missing, I know I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, just to, to put a little neat hat on this right off the bat, right? Genetic diversity can arise again, right? Like genetic diversity isn't on this, this uh, nosedive that, cannot, that it cannot recover from, right? Like mutations are like, the, the primary mm -hmm. source of new alleles. So assuming you have a, a, a parent group and you have a founder effect off of that group, right? 
they're, let's say you have a group of 100 that have split off from a group of 1,000. Odds are their genetic diversity is going to be lower than the parent population, right? Like odds are you're not getting a proper sampling of the, the parent diversity. And this is the founder effect, right? They, they go to a new location and alleles that may have been rare in the parent population that made it through to this daughter population, maybe they now have a, a greater chance to, to reach fixation uh, because they have a, a larger percentage of this new population. Um, we do the same thing with the bottleneck effect, making it through um, uh, large scale events. But the thing is, given mm -hmm. enough time, Mutations are going to emerge in both populations, both the parent group and this founder group that has now uh, set off on its own and, and founded this new subpopulation. And over time, this is what creates speciation, assuming that gene flow isn't occurring between these two groups and allowing them to uh, refresh one another's um, uh, reproductive um, ability to exchange alleles with one another again. Right. Eventually, they're going to accumulate mm -hmm. enough mutations, if assuming they happen in the right places, right? Because this, it has happened that extremely divergent groups can still exchange alleles. But for the most part, it doesn't take very long for uh, reproductive isolation to evolve between two groups. And then they'll no longer be able to exchange alleles again. Um, over that time period, it may be that that second group has also been accruing mutations that are, are adding to their genetic diversity. And then eventually, it may be that it's on par with the primary group again. So the point is, is that like, yes, there, there, by and large, there are more genetic differences within these, you know, categories that we tend to create than there are between them. And the reason for that is, is ultimately because humans are extremely low in our genetic diversity due in part to a bottleneck effect, several bottleneck effects that, a bottleneck effects that have impacted our population. Um, but this is why in, mm -hmm. in part, African populations tend to be significantly more genetically diverse than everyone else. It doesn't mean that there's no genetic diversity that has emerged since then in these various founding populations. It just means there hasn't been enough time for these other founding populations that have now created uh, uh, subpopulations that have their own mutations and characteristics and things like that to match the parent population that they left so long ago, right? Because diversity for the entire species is still extremely low. We are all ridiculously similar to one another. And of course, population level yeah. differences do not map with our conception of race either, which is why so many uh, geneticists yeah. and biologists, myself included, would say that race is not a biological reality. It simply isn't. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, cool. for sure, for sure. Thank you, Sweet. thank you for that clar clarifying that for me. Um, of yeah, course. and May I have also one more question add for a you. little bit to that as well. Oh yeah, thank you. Go yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I think it's also worth noting that when it comes to like what we even call races amongst humans is also so much a social construct in that you can see that what the borders of various racial groups were change through time, especially with needed political changes. Like the idea of there being black and yeah. white people was basically an invention of um, the early modern pe period to basically justify slavery. Um, early on, mm -hmm. white people oh, yeah, was sure. basically just British people and the Irish were a different race. Italians were a different yeah. race. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, while um, there are still some people with anti-Italian sentiments, most people think of Italians as white, not as a, another kind of people. Um, and other people that are grouped mm -hmm. together might be grouped together by a political thing, and we're willing to call them like one people, but there's actual diversity. Let me just give an example that might be less commonly known, because um, my wife is Chinese, so I'm trying to know more about Chinese history and culture. And we, you refer to people from China as Chinese people. But within China, they recognize, I believe it's 56 different ethnic groups. Um, so you go down to like the Hong Kong mm -hmm. region and it's not the same as the dominant um, Han racial group for most Chinese people. Um, if you go to the far west of China, it's actually more of a Turkish population and the Chinese spoken there is um, noticeably differently pronounced in that it doesn't even have tones like Mandarin Chinese does. Go to the northeast and it's um, uh, from a different racial group known as the uh, Manchus. And while my uh, wife is supposed to be of Han ancestry, her last name is actually of Menchu origin for mm -hmm. complex family reasons. But to outsiders, they're all just Chinese people. Within China, no, these are differences that are very noticeable. Yeah. And, and of course, Americans yeah. not telling the difference between Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese people is just because of what we have decided of how we lump people together. And the fact that who does the lumping decides what group you're in really tells you the groups are artificial. It's yeah, yeah, and, and I guess kind of context from that. Convergently in different locations, right? So the things that we might consider characteristic of one race actually show up in multiple races, right? Because it's just mm -hmm. how our genomes respond to selective pressures. Um, so, sorry, you were saying something. Yeah. 
No, oh, just because, like, I guess I, yeah, I think context matters. So, like, like so I'm, I'm, I'm also, um, I'm half Chamorro, which is, like, the indigenous, the indigenous people from the island of Guam. And so, like, when I read that, like, fact from, like, the, gen the Genome Project and stuff like that, like, there's more very genetic variation. I'm like, so, like, does that mean that I have more genetic, vari like, more, essentially more, there's, there's more genetic variation when amongst the people of Guam than, and then, um, out, you know, like, though I have more genetic, uh, genetics in common with people outside the, the island of Guam than within the island of Guam, or is that that different situation? You know what I mean? I'm yeah, I th I'm not. That, yeah. I don't recall the. I don't recall the specific criteria that the Human Genome Project or that the Thousand Genomes Project actually used to quantify like quote unquote races or like people groups. So I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, my inkling would be that they're that the groups are decently large in size. I mean, it it ultimately is always going to come down to the fact that it's like okay, the the two major groups are like folks who have like sub-Saharan ancestry, because this is like the original group that, that all humans descend from, right? Everything is a founder off of that group. So that diversity is the greatest. And then all of these other groups nest sequentially within that group uh, with regards to like genetic diversity and phylogeny. And then you can also look at things like uh, heterozygosity and linkage disequilibrium and things like that. Um, but overall, the, the diversity in general too, is just super low. With humans, we are all ridiculously yeah, similar. Yeah. And, and the minute we're, difference. We're, yeah, is, ridiculously not... inbreded. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. it's funny because people are always like, oh, man, like, what if Neanderthals had survived or Denisovans had survived or Floresiensis had survived? Like, what would life be like if we had to contend uh, and have a society with, with other species of human? And the answer is, there's a reason that we don't because we're we're already awful and we sh we have like the lowest level of diversity between us like we are already so similar and we still find reasons to be jerks to each other so it's like with other human species my yeah. goodness I can only imagine um so sorry does that does that answer your, there's just like a tangent that I, I came to mind um oh, did that no, answer your question oh yeah it did it's perfect um yeah and my only last question for you, and, and again, you can let me go if you want to answer it as, as I'm, I'm, I leave, but um, I did a super chat a couple of shows ago when you were on, and um, is that, do you have any updates on the whole Homo Naledi fiasco type of thing that happened? Oh my goodness. Yeah, actually, I have a video. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm more head on videos right now than I have been in quite some time. Um, I have a few like on the backlog, and I actually just finished another one on Homo Naledi. There was a paper that came out by uh, Delazine and colleagues recently that makes the whole thing a whole lot weirder. And like, I'll just say this, the, the work that this group has done on a dental sample on variation of the, of the teeth from the rising star cave system cannot preclude the possibility that they're all of the same sex. Like it's actually possible that the, the hominoleti sample, because it is so low in variation specifically, I believe is the maxillary P4, the maxillary and mandibular M1, and I think one of, oh, and the lateral incisor, the lateral maxillary incisor. The variation is so low that it actually falls below the variation of same-sex samples of sexually monomorphic species today. Like, it is weird, they are weirdly similar. Now, it could also be characteristic of the species in general, or it could be that we are looking at um, a, a just a very inbred group, that's a possibility too, but can you imagine what that does for the interpretation of like this proposed burial or proposed funeral caching if they're all of the same sex, like if it's all males or it's all females in a hominin with a brain case the size of Australopithecus and there's two dozen individuals down there? I don't know what that says about our, our assessing these hypotheses in general. I still buy the funeral caching. I don't buy the burials, but sorry, go ahead, Erin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that I think you actually are saying the evidence is now indicating that this was actually a man cave. Like for real, actually, <laughs> like it's actually possible. <laughs> and they probably, in which case, they probably died watching too much television, drinking too much beer, and right. just didn't get out enough. And, <laughs> and like, but like, it's funny. It's funny, but it actually might be. Tr it might be that we're sampling a, a single sex down there. That would be crazy. Like, yeah, I find it a very hard sell that flooding or predators are, are accumulating a single sex collection of two dozen individuals. That, that statistically is not going to fly for me. 
Um, does that mean that they're burying their dead and, and using fire and art and, you know, advanced tools and things like that and, and trussing up their dead to get them down to the bottom of this cave system? I don't think so. I still think there is another entrance. And I've mentioned this before um, on, I believe, in one of my videos, but there was a poster at the ABAs a couple years ago that was trying to characterize the geology of Rising Star Cave System. And they softly pitched the idea that there, there's been some reworking of that area. I know that's not what Berger and colleagues hold to now. They think that, like, Truly, Naledi had like squeezed through all these convolutions with the brain of an australopith, pulling its dead behind it and using fire to light the way since it's so far in the dark zone of this cave. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, but as far as like, oh, have, have there been any new developments with regard to like um, new papers that have come out outside of that one? I don't think so. The most recent one was Martin Young Torres that was like, there's not enough evidence for burials. Um, and there's not. There's not enough evidence for burials at present. But I think it's also quite but striking like, that of all the Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I think that's like unfortunate too, right? Because like it's having a having a ripple effect. Because like I'm in education and yeah, I've seen some I always like peruse obviously educational videos I can show like my students. And like that's already made its way into some of our, you know, educational videos on, on um human evolution. Like that's already now being said that we're doing burials and they're referring to Homo naledi. And it's like, yep. we don't know that yet. <laughs> but, we don't. But and, and it sucks because like yeah. none of the reviewers of all of the reviewers of that set of that initial set of papers, right, that was published in eLife on the, on the art and the burials and the potential fire, that was only like softly pitched, but, um, and the, the brain case I stuff, right? None of those reviewers were saying that they're definitely not burials. None of them, right? Every single one of them was like, they might be, but you don't have enough evidence to say that yet. The, the data are still inconclusive at present. You need to do more work, right? And some of the tests that they did were really weird with the, the sampling of the, um, of, the, of the soil in fossiliferous versus non-fossiliferous areas. That was super sketchy. Um, some of the figures were really weird. And I know there's some super competent people working on that team. Absolutely. So I'm not 100% sure what was going on with that. Maybe it was a rush job to get it out in time with the Netflix documentary, which also everyone hate, like, hated the fact that those two things coincided and the eLife publishing model is a mess. Uh, but the, the, best of my, the best of my ability, and I keep up pretty closely with the Naledi stuff, is the Martin and Torres stuff is the, is the most recent paper on the burials. And then there's this sex bias sampling thing that is just making the situation really weird. Because no matter what you hold to, whether you think that, it, that they got in there by accident somehow, that they were intentionally chucked down there, which is the idea that I think is the most um, reasonable. I think there's been reworking and there used to be an easy hole for them to chuck their dead down. Or they were intentionally burying them. Why do they all look so similar? Why is their variation so low? It, again, it is below sexually monomorphic species within a single sex. Like mm -hmm. the variation represented in some of these teeth, according to the most recent paper, are below like a group of all female gibbons who are ridiculously mon like males and female gibbons like look, look ridiculously similar. Their variation is not very high, and that it's still lower in that single sex. But I don't understand what's going on. Um, again, I, I I softly was thinking about the idea like, okay, well, what if they <laughs> what if they just went to like the the heart of the Appalachians and they got a super inbred pool of modern humans? up in the Appalachian somewhere, and they just tested the dental variability of them. Could you fit, would that explain mm -hmm. the variation, the lack of variation that we see in the Letty? I don't know. I have no idea. But the, the bottom line is it remains a very weird site. And I'm so glad that it exists. Like, it, there's, it's such a rich assembly. And it's, that's the other thing. It's all in the Letty. There's like a little bit of, uh, I think it was like some baboon postcrania. It might have been a tooth. But like one baboon remain and then like the rest is Naledi. How does that happen? If there's not some weird yeah. situation. I don't know. I can't explain it all. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I've, I've been turning and tossing about the Naledi situation. No, it's great. And I still don't have it. The weirder, <laughs> the, weirder it is, the weirder it is, the more interesting it is. <laughs> it is, exactly. And, uh, you know, again, I got a video coming out about that paper soon. We go over like the coefficient of variation method and like how they're actually assessing this variation tooth by tooth. So it, it should be pretty cool. So thank you for calling in, Michael. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, thank you all. You all have a good night. Wonderful. You as well. Oof, man. Yeah, it's... Sorry again. I, the Naledi stuff is always, always going to be something that gets me going because it is like... 
every aspect of it is controversial, like from how everything was published to the tests that were run to the site itself to the hominin and the interpretation of the morphology. All of it is weird. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you might want to hold off on your video on that for a few weeks because a new documentary is coming out that might answer some of the questions. Uh, it's called Godzilla x Kong the New Empire. That might answer some oh. of the questions. Yes, I'm hoping too that uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes will also offer <laughs> some, some, uh, some answers that we've been really looking forward to. Um, two excellent documentaries. The, the folks, those of us who really enjoy um, monster ape media are eating well this year, and I would lump myself in with that group. I love watching apes uh, fight and do funny ape stuff on screen. And when I say apes, I mean non-human apes, because we get plenty of human ape movies every year. Because <laughs> we're in them. <laughs> All right, let's do Super Chats. What do you think? That was our last call. All right, All right. let's Super let's Chat it up. Sweet. Six pounds and sixty-six. What is a what is the cent in? Oh, euros. And six sixty-six euros. Oh, these are euros. Pence. You're right. Yep. Okay. What uh, what is in, it in euros? In, what? in euros, they're cents. Okay, six euros so and six sixty-six, euros and 66 cents. <laughs> Wonderful. From uh, Leonard Steinke. What's the current leading hypothesis on how? Oh my God! Why would you ask this? <laughs> Why would you ask this, Leonard? This is this is such a controversial question on how why we developed bipedalism. That is um that is an enormous that is an enormous ask. I'm going to be as expedient as I possibly can. The how is pretty simple, um, and it's it's pretty dependent on uh, the why. The leading hypothesis, insofar as I understand it, and the one that I personally subscribe to, is that bipedalism evolved out of apes that were already orthograde. Uh, suspensory clamorers. So basically you have a critter that isn't too different from a modern day gibbon. Gibbons, which I love, are these cute little apes. They're very fluffy. They're, um, they're, they've got super wickedly long arms. And because their arms are so long, right, the way that they move in the trees is through suspensory brachiation. So they, they monkey bar. They go hand over hand when they're in the trees. And because of this, when they come to the ground, right, which they don't do very often, they have to be bipedal because their arms are so long. So what they do is when they're when they're in the trees where they're already upright, because again, they're doing this suspensory locomotor style, when they come down from the trees, they are, of course, bipedal. So the argument goes, what do you do with when you've got an ape that's bipedal in the trees and then you take away the trees? Will you get an ape that is being pressured to be more bipedal on the ground and increase its efficiency? Um, and the argument goes that when you look at the fossil record, and again, I subscribe to this, even though there are alternative hypotheses, you see exactly that. First, you see things like Aurorin tugenensis and Salantibus chinensis, which are, if you consider them hominins, and I do accept them as hominins, really apish, right? The only thing that they've got really pushing them towards hominins is a reduction in canine tooth size and aspects of the nuchal plane um, of the basic cranium. Other than that, they, they, they got an upright posture, and that's pretty much it. Um, once you reach Artipithecus ramidus, you have a couple of the other characteristics that are going to lend themselves towards being a more efficient biped when you come to the ground, right? The, the frame and magnum is still anterior, but you've also got like the, the pelvis of this thing is insane, right? The top portion of the pelvis, the ilium, is actually super derived in Artipithecus, and the lower portion, the ischium, is really basal. So you've got a pelvis that is literally in transition in a hominin that lived in a mosaic environment. So an environment that was a lot of trees, but also breaking up these trees are like patches of grassland. So you've got a hominin that's partially, you know, uh, fit for the trees and partially fit for the ground, living in an environment with both. Well, if that's not a transitional species, I'm not sure what is. It's been argued to have one arch in the foot, a partially valgus knee, and it's got that wickedly divergent toe that actually worked in part to help it like, grip the branches and in part to stabilize itself in the stance phase when it came down from the trees, biomechanically speaking. And then you've got Australopithecus, which by the time you hit Australopithecus, roughly like 4.2-ish million years ago, you're looking at something that's fully bipedal. Um, when Australopithecus was on the ground, it was bipedal, and there is like there is no denying that it has all of the suite of characteristics to be a biped, and it couldn't not have been a biped. Uh, so again, to like sum it up, my argument is that bipedalism evolved because you had an ape that was a suspensory clamberer and already upright in the trees because it made it easier to forge at the end of branches at the ends of branches, and then you take away the trees due to climate change, which happened at the end of the Miocene after the Miocene climatic optimum. And then you had a series of a population of apes that had to very quickly adapt to being first partially on the ground and then entirely on the ground. 
So I hope that made sense. <laughs> Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> 15 pounds from Freakish Upper. I was hoping to pick both your brains. If humans would go extinct, what species would you feasibly see developing sapience many generations from now? Both silly and serious answers are okay. Okay, Aaron, you first. Raccoons. Raccoons? Why? Well, for one thing, they already have basically opposable thumbs, so they got everything they need for tool making. Why not capuchins? Why not something that's already got the, the primate big brain to body size? Raccoons are cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that answer, actually. And you know what? Let's normalize that as good, like, scientific reasoning for supporting your, your hypothesis. Because it's cute. I support this. Um, this has my seal of approval. I want that known. Um, so I'll, I, I think my silly answer would be some kind of cephalopod. But unfortunately for cephalopods, um, I'll, I'll just, actually, I'll just pick one. Like, octopi. Um, or octopus, or maybe even a nautilus. I think that's a fun answer, but the set, because like, they have the tentacles, they could feasibly make tools using their tentacles, but the problem is, one, they live underwater, so no fire. They would have to become terrestrial first. And two, and this is the sadder answer, they have really short lifespans, right? It's it's really mm -hmm. hard to to do a lot in their short little lifespans. Even the females, which tend to live a lot longer than the males, max out at like i think eight years in some of your great pacific octopus octopodes octopi whatever i think all of those are what we need are is accessible. what we need is the octopi uh the octopus to become intelligent enough that it can come out of the water and tell us what its preferred plural is wonder finally some finally some good content exactly like i want them to come tell us their preference and um, I, I also want them to, to hang out with us and help us achieve interstellar dominance. My for real answer is only if all primates are extinct, my money is on, um, my money is on proboscideans or crows. One mm -hmm. or the other. Okay, next question. Five dollars from Whiskey Spirit Guide. What's blue and bad for your teeth? A brick moving at nine tenths the speed of light. That's a joke for you, Aaron. <laughs> he didn't like it was indeed there that. that i would have to do the math on that but if the, assuming the brick is red then moving at that speed that would probably have a gamma factor of at least two so yeah yeah it would probably move into the blue spectrum so yeah a brick moving at that speed would i think be blue-ish um bad for my teeth is a very very uh lax way to put what would happen in that collision <laughs> uh oh actually i'm doing the math actually a brick moving at that velocity would have a similar amount of kinetic energy as an atomic weapon so it would be bad for your teeth to be fair because your teeth would be, would be atomized. bad for a city's teeth <laughs> you would what's the thing oh, yeah. it's like your teeth would be reduced from like would be reduced from biology to chemistry in an instant <laughs> It might even go beyond that. I mean, I'd have to actually do the math to think if actually it would become plasma, in which case even chemistry doesn't apply. We'll just say bad for your teeth, because I think that's true. I think that still holds. It's, it's like saying, you know, like like you said, it's like, and it, is an atomic weapon bad for a city? Yes, and it's also bad for your teeth. <laughs> okay, yeah, 120. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, tell me, what the, what is this currency? CZK? I think Czech kroners? Is that it? Okay, check kroner. 120 check kroner from Naresh. If Matt and Arden have hog no snakes, they should name one Don, Don Hog No Snake. Shout, shout out to Faye and Joe Jack for making me super chat this. Okay, shout out to both of you. Thank you for your super chat. $20 from Landry. While I don't have grant money to donate for further research, I do appreciate learning such great science. Did you know that ants never get sick because they have little antibodies i'm putting a ban on pun or joke super chats <laughs> i'm just kidding make send more of them they, they make me and aaron smile but i'm smiling because i'm in I, so much pain just to let you know that i used to teach high school and uh my students had to listen to my puns on a daily basis and they were practicing trying to respond with puns and then i would respond with even more puns back and they would learn their place but still there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
I, I, yeah, I would imagine because you're the you're the uh, the alpha at the, the top of that hierarchy for sure. <laughs> Five dollars from Meridian oh. Heights. Hey, Erica, do you know why you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're go really good at it. Okay, yeah, more jokes like this as well. I I like this one a lot. <laughs> The, the Proboscidean talent for arboreality is underappreciated. $5 from Monkey at a Typewriter. As an Orthodox secularist, I believe you're all heretics who won't go to any hell. Repent, for the end is scientifically assured. This is wonderful. I would like to subscribe to your religion and newsletter. Thank you, Monkey at a Typewriter. Unfortunately, it comes out with a lot of uh, mess on the paper, because again, Monkey at yeah. a Typewriter, it's, it's, it's unclean. <laughs> Of course, unless yeah, unless we're speaking with Kanzi, but he's using his uh his his lexigram to do that. So it it would also be a ma it would be a series of symbols. Five dollars from Monkey to Typewriter again. Secular can't appreciate art. Must be why Christian music is topping all the charts. That heathen Taylor Swift can't compete. Great host. This is yeah, this is actually true. And the the support for this, of course, is Christian Rock uh, and Dan Letha, who makes all the Young Earth creationist comics that are uh, like. They are, they are what Vanta Black is to color to humor, right? Like it all disappears in in the black hole of Dan Letha's comics. You should check them out; they're horrible. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ten dollars from Larry Fishman. We have particle accelerators and space telescopes now. Why do people still try to use petty word games, philosophy, to explain the origin of the universe? Um, I think for the same reason that flat earthers are flat earthers, which is like they they want to feel like they are in on a really big secret that no one else is privy to. I I want to be more fair in that there are definitely legitimate mysteries about the origins of the universe because heck, the scientists, the cosmologists working on this are working on it because it's still unknown. Uh and there are reasonable philosophical questions that need to be answered because indeed, is it possible that the universe could be infinite in the past or is there some philosophical reason why it can't be even possible? Um, I'm open to uh, a philosopher definitively coming to a conclusion and showing why that's the case. Um, it's just that I also see how philosophy has gone and it usually makes a lot of progress once new data comes in and that's what science is really good at. Mm. Uh, so science is the I've heard it, I would say that basically science is philosophy with really good data. Nice. Yeah, I like this too. I, I want to be clear, when I'm talking about like behaving like flat earthers, I'm more meaning like when people see data to the contrary of their currently held idea of things and then are like, mm, no, I think I'm right and we'll just find data later that support. Right, I totally agree that there are a myriad of unknowns in every single field. In fact, they greatly outnumber the knowns. That's why science is fun. That's why we enjoy it so much. And that's one of the, the great joys about being human is getting to, to sate that curiosity. And even when you don't figure out the answer, it's still fun along the way. I'm mostly coming after the people who are like, no, I, I simply reject the data itself. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I can't do anything with that. Five dollars from Monkey to oh. Typewriter. I don't have the balls to tell a PhD my pet theory. It makes me want to try religion just to know what that kind of confidence feels like. Oh, you don't need religion. You just need a Twitter account. <laughs> I, I oh my god! Actually, I completely concur. Yeah, and I I'm gonna come to religion's rescue here. I know plenty of religious people who are like the polar opposite of what some of the folks we had on tonight are. Um, there is a specific mm. personality that when combined with religion or combined with any like weird fringe uh, idea or ideology, they just become like this, this super powered irritation to all of us who enjoy um, <laughs> science and, uh, and good company. $10 from Charlie Carrot, helping to pay those dills, bills. Thank you, Charlie Carrot. I will specifically tell Jimmy that you came to the rescue. Five pounds from Faye. Love you both. Erica asks, so Aaron, can you explain what the delayed quantum eraser double slit experiment implies? Erica, are you a transhumanist? Um, jury's still out for me on that. I, I really enjoy my, my ape body. I enjoy it. I don't know that you can progress past perfection, which is the, the hominoid that we currently are. 
But maybe you can, I don't know. I mean, I guess Law of Monophile, you would still be an ape, you'd just be a robot ape, which does sound really cool, admittedly. I, again, I need to think on this. Okay, Aaron, your turn. So I will probably not be able to speak to this with any good detail, but the quantum eraser is basically this experiment uh, which basically takes the quantum, uh, the, the double slit experiment and the weirdness there and adds another layer where basically, um, in effect, by which sensor you are measuring from, it affects what you see from another sensor. I'm leaving out basically all the details because I don't think I can, um, off the top of my head, explain it well. So um, it's basically trying to show another strange effect where the measurement at one point uh, affects the measurement in another spot in a ways that seem to be um, causally impossible because it also is independent of both the speed of light and even like the order of operations. But there has been also some recent discussion and debate if it's actually the experiment results are being interpreted correctly. And I know that uh, Sabine Hoffmeyer, another physicist with a YouTube channel, has talked about this a couple of times, and I would probably refer to her videos rather than my stellarly poor memory about the exact details of this particular setup. Thank you, Faye. All right, $10 from Ergo Meister. Do you know of any phenotypic traits from Neanderthal or Denisovan populations that were introduced into modern human populations? Actually, there's an entire um, like gene catalog of characteristics that probably came from like Neanderthals or Denisovans or even um, both of them, like characteristics that their common ancestor had that, that they retain. Uh, but a lot of them have to do with minute things. And unfortunately, a lot of the Neanderthal ones are negative, like their predispositions to, to certain diseases. Uh, and what that has suggested to some, uh, like biological anthropologists, like, you know, geneticists and things like in the vein of Sante Pabo, is that perhaps that's why we have like less Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. Um, then maybe we actually interbred with them because they were actually under like negative selection to weed them out of the gene pool. Uh, but I'm not sure how much support there is for that idea. It, it also, we, we do think based off of the, the <laughs> lack of mitochondrial Neanderthal like contribution, the level of contribution from Neanderthals on the mitochondrial side of things, we think maybe there was like an element of hybrid sterility too, like moving into the past, like how much interbreeding actually did occur. Um, but yes, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> All right, five dollars from Faye. If you both watch movies involving your specialist topic, what is the most obviously wrong film example that you can remember? Ten thousand BC, and it's not even close. Like the, the, anything, and I don't even study that time period. But they had mammoths helping them build the pyramids. I'm begging you, please, please don't do that. That's a really good choice. Um, the first one that came to my mind was Armageddon, because oh my god, oh no, Ooh. I love that movie. I mean, I know it's horrible, but I still love it. I love it in the well, same way that I love just what. Let me give you just one example of where the science just screams, "Holy crap!" No, the final climactic moment where they have to detonate the nuclear weapon inside the middle of the asteroid just before it gets too close that there's enough time for it to split in half and avoid the Earth. So they actually, like, on the screen, give you enough information about, like, the size of the asteroid, the altitude it's blown oh, off at, no! and you can go ahead and do the numbers, and you'd realize the yield of the atomic weapon you would need. And when you do the number crunching, you'd find you don't need the energy of an atomic weapon to split this asteroid. You need the output of the sun. <laughs> That's so And you're going to so do that basically. Doomed. Oh, no. And of course, you can imagine what was going to happen on Earth when a nuclear weapon with the same yield as the sun, basically blowing up just north of the, or just above That's the Earth's so atmosphere. <laughs> yep. So among oh, many no. other problems it with this film, that's just one. So um, I believe in astronomy, it might be the wrongest movie that ever wronged. Nope, nope, nope. I have a better one for you. I bet I guarantee you okay. you haven't seen this movie or you would say that this is worse. Have you seen Moonfall? I know what you're talking about. Moon is a giant computer machine thing. I, I have not watched it. I just know that that's the basic premise. 
No, no, not Moon, which is pretty good. Moonfall, which is made by the same guy that did like Day After Tomorrow in, tw- in 2012. The moon is falling to the earth and it's going, and they have to find a way to keep that from happening. I am begging you to watch this movie. I, you, actually, I, I think it might be hazardous for your health. So I'm going to recommend that you in particular don't because I'm a ding dong when it comes to astronomy and when it comes to physics. And even I saw this movie and I was like, this is like, it. you know, the comparison you just made, the yield of the atomic weapon would actually have to be as big as the sun. If Armageddon is that nuclear weapon from Armageddon, Moonfall is the sun. That's the difference that we're talking about here. That's how much worse this movie is. I had so much fun watching it. I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> okay. I thought part of it, though, was also like they, um, like, they do send a mission to the moon and they find out the moon is actually hollow and it's a giant machine and there was some sort of AI yes. apocalypse in the past. That does happen. That does happen, yes. Amongst all of the okay. other things, that does happen. But there is a specific scene where the moon, like repeatedly the moon will get so close to the earth that the, that the gravity is like overlapping and so it's pulling things off of the earth towards itself. But then they try to launch a rocket at the same time and then the rocket, it, I can't even explain it very well, but people in chat, I would like it very much if you encouraged Aaron to watch Moonfall. So please tell him to watch Moonfall. Am I right or am I and right? If I, may also give, if I may also give the opposite of that, there is actually a different Moonfall into the Earth story uh, by Neil Stevenson. It's called Seven Eves. Um, something basically hits and smashes the moon into a million pieces. And because of that, then the moon's parts then actually begin to fall to the Earth, causing that sort of apocalypse. But, and they realize, hey, we got basically this many years to basically create a mission to get humans off the Earth to survive this apocalypse or otherwise bury people down as deep as possible to possibly survive it. It's called Seven Eves. Honestly, the book feels like there were like multiple endings, endings like kind of attached to each other. There isn't like a proper like five act structure, but um, it's good science fiction in that. And so I'd say besides like the starting premise, it basically just being a uh, MacGuffin to get the whole thing started. Uh, Neil Stevenson usually tries to go out of his way to make things uh, scientifically sound. Like, re- yeah, reasonable-ish. That's, I, I love that. Yeah. I really do enjoy it. I, if I can't, my problem though, and I'm not even getting into it. I, I'm just going to stick it with, I enjoy natural disaster movies. I enjoy uh, watching them for the spectacle. And I recognize that not one of them has ever been accurate that I've seen. And I'm just going to have to live with that. Five pounds from Bold the Villain. Erica, did you spend time in, when you spent time in the UK, did you visit the NHM in London? Took my daughter there last week. She loved the place, saw the OG Archaeopteryx, smaller than expected. Um, I have been to the NHM no fewer than like 10 times. Maybe it was nine times. I went to the NHM so often because it is amazing. I love that museum. I love the, the human origin section. I love the Darwin collection, which is also amazing. The whole thing is dope. I cannot recommend it enough. I'm so glad that you guys have fun there. And it's free. That's why I went so many times. You just take public transport there and then go and you just spend an entire day there. I could probably, I have the, me- the layout of that place memorized. It was epic. All right. Uh, I've been Five. there once. One quick question. I thought the, I thought the Archaeopteryx they have there is actually a cast. The original is in Germany, but please correct me. So they keep all, they keep all casts like not out. Um, so I'm not sure if the original is currently in Germany or if it's currently at the NHM. My understanding is that it has been both in both places. Like it's gone back and forth, but I don't remember if the one that's there okay. now is and, the legit one. Okay. And I asked him because I, mean, I was there, but that was, yeah. And I, and I, and I half remember this because I was there about 20 years ago and things have probably changed yeah, in that time as well. It's possible, yeah. I mean, I know, I know at the um, at the Kenya National Museums, like they have some really high quality casts that are on display, but nothing that is on display is actually the real material um, at mm-hmm. most museums. Okay, uh, five New Zealand dollars from Deepak Stevens. First time watching this show. I wish I had you guys as teachers in school. Probably would have learned a lot more uh, science and biology. Great show. That's great to hear. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm glad you had a blast. I I have a blast every time I'm here. So. You know, you should keep showing up and you'll keep having a blast. Nine ninety nine from Jason. Great show. I wonder your thoughts on the gay humpback whales recently photographed in Hawaii and how common it is in other species. Hashtag whale pride. I, it bothers me that this isn't more common knowledge, but mammals are incredibly gay. Like if it's a social mammal, it's probably doing gay stuff at least a little bit. And the reason for this is because 
social animals, they like doing affiliative things to each other, whether that's grooming or in the case of bonobos, kissing on the mouth using tongue or even just having full on sexual intercourse because things that feel good and make the group more coherent are good in social animals. And for this reason, they do gay stuff all the time. And that's why when someone says something as brain dead as homosexuality, is it natural? You can inform them that the majority, I think it's the majority of social mammals, but it might be like a little less. I can't remember the precise numbers. An overwhelming amount of social mammals do gay stuff from lions to American bison to pretty much every kind of primate you can think of. So yes, hashtag whale pride. <laughs> Five Canadian dollars from Terry the Whispelier. Whale falls have traveling communities of small creatures that move from corpse to corpse. Where would I look to find out if dinosaurs had the same? You know, that's a really good ant. That's a really good question. Um, I imagine that the substrate has something to do with it. I don't know that you would have the same degree of like community um, ecological breakdown in dinosaurs, which are terrestrial, um, as compared to whales, because they've they've sunk to the bottom of like the the benthic of the bed, the, the abyssal zone. That's what you call it, um, where critters almost entirely subsist on things like whale falls. But I bet your best modern analog would be dead elephants. To be perfectly honest, like big dead terrestrial mammals. But you can check Google Scholar. Five dollars from SJL <clears throat> primary commandment of scientism. Have a theory, try to disprove it. Theists always try to use changes in science as to why it's wrong. That is true, and it mm. drives me up a wall. I, I don't know if you've experienced this, Aaron, but like to me, when they're like, "Oh, who science is saying this this week," and they're saying this next, they'll be saying this next week because they've changed their mind so many times. Brother, that is its greatest strength: the fact that it can change with new information. I don't know why this is always presented as a negative. <clears throat> it's it just falls into the black and white thinking. You were wrong at one point, then you're definitely wrong now, and I'm not going to believe you because you were at one time wrong. And we got to be absolutely uh, hard on everything. You can't say, well, this is probably true. No, no, right or wrong. Uh, pick a side. We're at war. <laughs> yep. And then like you get the presuppositionalists too, who are usually the ones proposing it. And then it's like, oh, well, wh well why do you think you're correct? And it's like, well, I presuppose it. And it's like. Okay, cool. Uh, we are moving forward exactly zero steps in this conversation forever. <laughs> yep. Five dollars from Doc Don Hogg. Professor Gibbon name dropped history with Kaylee in a recent video. Collab video or live stream when? Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy Stowe. I would love to collab with history with Kaylee. We've chatted on Twitter. We're we are in each other's DMs, as it were. We're trying to work something out because um, I, I really do enjoy her content, and I wish I was a professor. I'm not yet, but I will be soon in the next couple of years probably <laughs> erica remember to be a professor you just have to profess things this is true or if i wanted to expedite the process i could just go to patriot university and uh write a thesis on the level of dr kent hovind who as i love to remind people began his thesis with hello my name is kent hovind <laughs> which is I just think you need to actually take this up a notch what you need to do is create your own university so you can be a university chancellor. Ooh, I do that, and then I um I make it so that all you have to do to get your dissertation is you have to do the what Patriot University required, but you have to do it in crayon on construction paper and make it even more of a gulf. <laughs> Five dollars from Doc Don Hog. Disney's black hole accuracy confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not watched that film mostly because. I can only take so many bad science films at once, but um, uh, it's from the late seventies. I know it exists, and it basically has like the spiral or um, uh, whirlpool black hole imagery, which is not accurate. Ooh. But I haven't watched enough to know how much I need to tear my hair out. That is bizarre. I've never even heard of that. That's crazy. I didn't even know anybody had it's ever exactly, that. Yeah, it's it's not exactly a classic of Disney. Uh, but I think you can probably rent it off YouTube for five bucks or whatever. Yeah, or other means, if I felt like sailing the high seas, which I would never do, but that's a possibility. 
$10 from Fine Point. I just wanted to say thank you to Erica for introducing me to the Mind Electric and by extension Miracle Musical. It has been occupying my brain for the past six months. Anytime someone tells me that my channel has introduced them to uh, the Mind Electric or Miracle Musical as a whole, it, it makes me almost as happy as when people email me and tell me they're not creationists anymore because this is they, they need more attention and I know there will never be a Hawaii Part 3. I recognize that. But I can't stop myself from trying to hope that if enough people are fans, then maybe maybe the, the, the Tally Hall folks will consider it. Although Joe Hawley is like falling off the deep end as well, so I'm not really sure what to do with that information. You should watch um, or you should listen to any and all of Tally Hall as well if you enjoy uh, Miracle Musical and you're not listening to them already, as well as uh, the scary jokes, because I enjoy them and find them in a similar sort of existential, um, weird musical vein. I, I don't know what you would even call it. They're not really like a genre, but I think they're similar, so give it a shot. Anyways, tangent over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, $5 from Monkey to Typewriter. Show pitch. We clockwork orange Dr. Adair in a chair to force him to ingest Moonfall, the core Armageddon deep impact. I would watch that straight. Are you trying to kill him? You want him to die? All right. All right. So you, you, you just reminded me of the core. No, the core is worse than Armageddon in terms of science. Oh, fucking God. Oh, that movie. Ow. 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 The aneurysm is back. Ow. Oh. You would not okay. survive me. I'm just telling you that right now. Now, here's the thing. I think I would be able to survive Boonfall because I know it's a Roland Emmerich film, and I'm usually okay with what's going on there. I know there isn't a conspiracy theory that he will not swallow and turn into a film. Uh, but really, the only movie that Emmerich has actually made that I actually felt like hurt me was Godzilla because of what he did to my boy. <laughs> yeah, that that hurt. That one did hurt. Um, I, and I, I see this as I've there's not been very many Roland Emmerich films that I can't find enjoy that I cannot find enjoyable because they are they're schlock. I mean, it, it's it's popcorn nonsense, and I I love it, and I eat it hook, line, and sinker. But what they did with Godzilla '98, that was a rough one. I do agree. Um, but I'm telling you right now, Moonfall is a completely different animal. You you are not prepared for what you will see. I can promise you that. I, I understand I'm saying this with a lot of like dread and, and it feels very ominous, but that's because I, I mean it. It's bad. And it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, not I've, just a popcorn movie. It's a popcorn and strong drink movie. Like, it, I don't even know. I mean, strong drink. Like, you might have to black out to fully experience Moonfall properly. Like, it is just, it is... It is something else. And I know that it's like a trope on YouTube for people to be like, oh, ooh, Moonfall is like the craziest one. But it's like, before I saw the, the internet response to Moonfall, my husband and I saw it. And it is to this day one of the best theater experiences I've ever had because the entire theater and where I live, it, folks aren't known for being like particularly science educated, to be honest. Uh, and everybody was like, what the hell is going on? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And there's not a shot any of this makes any sense. And th if they could recognize it, you won't survive. I'm just telling you that now. $5 I'm going to take it Doc the same way if I go and watch The Room with a group of people. We know this is bad cinema. We're doing it that's for the social experience. That's how you treat it. You might survive if you treat it like that. But get, get all your friends together and watch it. And just like, if you did, you can't play any drinking games, though. If you play any drinking games, like, oh, we take a shot every time the science is bad, you'll, you'll die. So like, maybe a shot every 10 times the science is bad. And then you will just be in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Five dollars from Dog Don Hog. Will you accept a picture of my sidewalk chalk dissertation? Uh, that is an auto pass at my university. So is it, I'm assuming it's a moderately sized sidewalk. So yes, we accept this. I okay. think we need to have some standards. It needs to go through a decent uh, Instagram filter. It does. Yes, that is true. We, we need an Instagram filter just to really spice things up. $5 from Cyruso X. I love the black hole. Great movie, but it is pretty much 100% scientifically inaccurate. That's tragic. I'm assuming the OBJ was an emoji. Oh, no. Wait, I wanted to see what the emoji was. Um, nope, it wasn't an emoji. Okay, folks. I had a blast. How did you feel about this episode? Aaron, what was your, what was your take on our callers today? 
positive experience? I was I was pleasantly surprised how wonderful and constructive all the conversations were. So um, I don't know if that's good or bad for um, bringing in the money with the, the less drama and hang up, but I yeah. enjoyed these conversations and I'm glad people got things out of it. Listen, I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic loyalist. This is my favorite show. And it's not just because this is the only one I've been on. <laughs> Five Canadian dollars from Terry. It was spillier again. Uh, Erica, put your money where your mouth is. If Aaron has to watch Moonfall, you have to watch. I've seen Tusk. That's a nice try. Oh. I have seen Tusk. I've already been through Tusk. I've been through the trenches. So don't apologize because I did it to myself. I watch creationist content. I'm a masochist. This one is established. <laughs> um, all right. I, I also enjoyed this. I, I thought this was a good, a good series of calls. We had a nice mix of theist and non-theist too. So, you know. I, I've been on some where it's like it's literally no theist callers, and then I've been on others where it's only theist callers, and both of those can give me headaches for different reasons. <laughs> so, everybody, my gentle and of course very modern apes, thank you so much for being with us here on Skeptalk tonight. I hope you had as much fun as we did, and we certainly hope that you will join us here next time on the next episode. And in the meantime, oh God, I, I almost just blanked. Aaron, do you want to plug your content? Do you want to plug your your anything that you do? Any any Twitters, any YouTube channels before we go? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the website that I have most everything at is draerinadare.com. Uh, has links to my various socials. Uh, of course, we'll mention the couple of books that I've published. Most recently, Science and Religion, a uh, book about um, aliens and religion where two worlds collide. Uh, so basically, Ooh. do aliens exist? What's the science behind that? And what are the possible theological implications and conundrums that that produces Ooh, that sounds good i would i would 100 percent read that i'm gonna go to your website and give it a little look see we'll see what happens i've got my book reading list is like so big right now five dollars from doc don hog year one watch party at least year one is a comedy Ten thousand bc is not a comedy Ten thousand bc is not meant to be funny i can watch jack black and michael Sarah uh screw around and and do goofy stuff all day long i really can uh, but that's because we know it's a comedy. Now, to be fair, I would also watch a gritty, uh, dark, <laughs> Pleistocene uh, encounter with Jack Black and Michael Sarah as well. I would love to see them act their little hearts out and, and be um, like either Neanderthals or anatomically modern Homo sapiens trying to survive um, a hostile environment. Five dollars. Oh, or, or Jack Black dealing with a giant ape named King Kong. I would, I love the Peter Jackson King Kong. People hate on it. I think that movie is so much fun. I recognize its flaws. I understand it, right? I know about the gummy, the gummy sauropods. I know about how long it is and how silly and corny some of the dialogue is. I don't care. I will enjoy that movie 10 times out of 10. There's a big ape in it and Jack Black says funny lines. So I will watch it. I will consume. Four ninety nine from Eli. I'd like to submit a thesis written on an etch a sketch. That's incidentally also an auto pass, as well as if you like etched it into Play Doh. <laughs> okay, this time for real. Thank you very much for being here, guys. This has been Skep Talk, and I hope to see you real soon in the next one. Cue the dance music. Cue the dance music. It's coming. There it is. <laughs> And then you dance to it, and it's... And then uh, I prove I don't know how to dance. Same, I do the same moves every time, the whole time. And I'm still not sure if they can hear us or not, to be perfectly honest. I just kind of do it anyways. Oh, they don't think they can't hear me now.